All right, it's 8.30 um, and uh, uh, it's a good time to start our uh, second session on uh, Moiré materials. Uh, my name is Johannes Lischner, I'll be host this morning. We have a set of eight talks and uh, the first one will be uh, an invited talk given by uh, Jose Lado. So uh, without further ado, Jose, please, please take it away. Uh, I should say that uh, all questions uh, should be typed into into the chat, and at the end of the uh, at the end of each talk, I will uh, read them out to the speakers. So we'll have uh, thirty minutes for the invited talk, and uh, followed by about eight minutes of questions, and then we'll have fifteen minutes for the contributor talk, followed by about uh, three minutes of questions. And I'll try try to keep us on time so people you know if they join from other sessions uh, you know can catch the talks that they want so uh, Jose please please go ahead um, thank you Johannes for the very nice introduction so let me uh, share my screen now uh, so you can see my screen right yes yes great uh, so yeah, uh, thank thank you, Johannes, for this uh, very nice introduction. And first of all, of course, uh, I'd like to to thank the organizers, Joh Johannes, Lenny, and Dima, for this very nice opportunity of talking today here. And of course, uh, Michael and the rest of the organizers of this conference. That I think it has been a really great idea to have this online conference where we can see, let's say, the latest advances in different fields in condensed matter in Europe. So um, today, uh, I'd like to to tell you about how we can create controllable correlated states by using twisted two-dimensional materials with, uh, that are magnetically encapsulated. So this, this, uh, this idea is uh, essentially based on something that we are exploiting in condensed matter for quite some years now, which is looking for exotic physics in quantum materials. So, I mean, of course, we've been uh, looking for different compounds, different complex compounds that show so exotic physics that we usually don't see in conventional ones. And you can think about all the quantum spin liquid compounds that we are looking for, or unconventional superconductors, or the various forms of topological matter. Uh, and of course, we have many three-dimensional compounds, well compounds that show this phenomenology. And this represents one of the most important directions in condensed matter physics now, not only from the fundamental point of view, in a sense that we may be able to un understand and realize new unconventional uh, states of matter that we've not seen so far, but also from the possibility of having some important technological impact of, for example, um, fractional excitation for doing a topological quantum computer in the optimal case, let's say. Uh, so in the last years, we've seen that uh, twisted two-dimensional materials are actually a new player in this field of correlated states of matter, of unconventional states of matter. And, and the idea is fairly simple. We start with two-dimensional materials that, in principle, they are not strong interacting. We put them on top of another, twist them, and we get some unconventional correlated state. And of course, one of the most uh, paradigmatic examples of this is the case of twisted bilayer graphene, which is almost the simplest twisted 2D material that you can think of. So uh, you take, and let, let us just think how remarkable this, uh, this system is, that you take a system that is chemically pure, that consists only on two layers of graphene, and depending on the angle that you choose between the two layers, you get completely different phenomena ranging from superconductivity to topological networks, to strange metals, to various uh, types of quasi-crystalline physics, correlated insulators, and even topological insulators. And this happens in this uh, very simple material. It's a material that consists on two layers of graphene. So th this is, let's say, very exciting from the fundamental point of view, in a sense that it's telling us that somehow, just by taking a single compound formed by two layers of graphene, just depending on the angle that we choose between the layers, we can get completely different universes for electrons. So we can get universes in which electrons are only capable of providing one direction, or universes in which electrons, they have to couple together to, uh, to exist at finite energies or even universes, which perhaps in the future, electrons lose their own identity and they become some fractionalized particles. So th this is, let's say, very suggestive from the theoretical point of view and connects with uh, some idea that had been in condensed matter for quite some time, which is the idea of engineering artificial quantum states so, or engineering artificial emergent states in materials 
or other uh, or other realizations. And of course, there, there are let's say several uh, several platforms, and we've been studying this for a for a long time. As is the case of cold atoms, that uh, where we can realize different kinds of correlated states and different kinds of lattices with tunable hoppings. Uh, other systems that consist on atomic lattices in which we can control the exact position of individual atoms and optimally uh, engineer a specific correlated, correlated states of matter. And finally, this new player in this field, which are twisted two-dimensional materials, which in the, in the future, perhaps we can also use to simulate artificial Hamiltonian and to explore new states of matter that we are not capable of finding in natural compounds. So one of the most important things of twisted 2D materials is that we have a huge degree of freedom to engineer uh, different structures. So if you think just about the, the case of graphene in which we got different phases at the same time, you can imagine that if you start combining other two-dimensional materials like semiconductors or superconductors or ferromagnets, insulators, quantum spin, hull insulators, or even quantum spin liquids, you can uh, you have the possibility of creating states that have a phenomenology even richer than twisted bilayer graphene. And of course, this is something that uh, we already started doing it. We already started combining different 2D materials beyond graphene and beyond bilayer graphene to get some artificial, some new artificial states of matter. And some of the, the most recent examples of this are the cases of twisted dicarcogenides, where we have also seen correlated insulators and superconductors, twisted graphene trilayers, or twisted graphene double bilayers that show a, that show a phenomenology that similar, that's similar to the twisted bilayer graphene, and sometimes even more remarkable, as it is the case of uh, ferromagnetic superconductivity in the twisted double bilayer graphene. So what this is showing us is that by combining these different 2D materials, we have a, a huge degree of freedom. We have so much freedom that we may be able to engineer some state of matter that we were not capable of finding so far in a natural compound or perhaps finding in twisted graphene by the year so far. So the, the idea that this is suggesting us is that uh, perhaps in these twisted 2D materials, we can go one step beyond of what we can usually do with whole compounds and what we can usually do with the other platforms for artificial quantum matter. So, of course, one of the ideas that have been on the field for quite some time is that these twisted graphene bilayers may allow us to understand something more about high TC superconductors by allowing us to explore uh, phase diagrams that we were not capable of uh, accessing so far. But you can even start dreaming more and think that perhaps these twisted 2D materials may allow us to realize some completely unconventional state of matter that we have not seen so far, such as a fractional topological insulator or some state uh, showing paraferdians or some, something else that we have not think about it yet. And perhaps in the, very, in the future, perhaps if we are very optimistic, we could even use these two twisted 2D materials and the correlated states twisted in, in twisted 2D materials to create some topological quantum computer. But it's, this is, of course, just dreams so far. This is just the idea of what would be the best thing that could happen in these compounds. So, but let's stick to it. Let's uh, try to imagine that we are aiming towards this, that we are aiming towards realizing some unconventional state of matter in which we uh, decide that we want to create a very specific Hamiltonian with very specific interactions, very specific kinetic energy, knowing that that Hamiltonian will show the phenomenology that we are looking for. Uh, and if you have this mindset of engineering a Hamiltonian, there are basically three things that you would like to control in a Hamiltonian. So the first one is you, you want to control the electronic interaction, which in twisted to the materials we can uh, do in a relatively effective way with a twist angle. The second thing is that you want to control small details of the electronic dispersion. So for example, you may want to control where your chemical potential is exactly or what are the some very small splittings in the different bands that we can also control uh, using by inter interlayer biases, for example, as it is shown in twisted double bilayers. And there's a third thing that, that it's perhaps a little bit more complicated to control, which is the local degrees of freedom that we have in our state. So usually if you think about uh, twisted bilayers or twisted dicalcogenides, uh, we usually have several quantum numbers like valley and spin, but for some correlated state, we may want to only have valley or we may want to only have spin. 
So this third ingredient is what I'm going to focus on today. And what I want to tell you today is that we can use magnetic materials as uh, leads for twisted 2D materials uh, to control these internal degrees of freedom in a potentially correlated state in a twisted 2D material. Uh, and, th and this idea is actually just a simple evolution from something that has been in van der Waals materials for quite some time, which is the idea of van der Waals spin morphotronics, which is the idea of combining conventional 2D materials with 2D magnetic material that have been discovered just four or five years ago. And there are already, let's say, many uh, experiments that demonstrate that combining these magnetic to the materials with other to the materials can actually give rise to very rich phenomenologies. So for instance, it has been shown that in van der Waals magnetic heterostructures, one can have giant magnetic resistance, that we can have a magnetic proximity effect that can be probed optically. And even recently that by combining superconductors with ferromagnets, we can get topological superconductivity. So what I'm going to do today is to just explore what happens when you combine all these findings that people uh, have uh, discovered in the last years with correlated twisted bands. So the ingredients that I'm going to focus on today are fairly simple. So I'm basically going to take three different 2D materials that are graphene, uh, a semiconductor, like a uh, transition metal like alcotinite, and ferromagnetic insulators. And essentially, I'm going to combine twist, exchange proximity effect, spin orbit coupling, and interactions. And before going to the main story, let me first thank the people that actually make uh, these two stories possible that I'm going to tell you today. And in particular, I want to thank David for the uh, story in relation with the twisted dichalcogenide and Tobias, Jani, and Odet with our four hour story in relation with this body mixing correlation in twisted bilayer graphene. So let's start with, uh, with the first one, which is essentially what correlated states can we get when we combine a twisted dichalcogenide that it's encapsulated in between two different ferromagnetic components. That it's basically what you see in the image here. So to understand the, this component, let me first give you a brief reminder of twisted dichalcogenides. So twisted dichalcogenides are uh, semiconductors with, uh, with strong spin orbit coupling uh, that essentially uh, at low energies can be described with a massive Dirac equation that, that, it's, that has a mass that is body and spin dependent. So essentially, uh, we have, let's say, four bands for, each, uh, for the valence band and conduction band for a monolayer. And we have, let's say, body splittings that come from spin orbit coupling. Uh, so the idea is that we initially have, let's say, four quantum numbers, body and spin, somehow similar to what we have in graphene. But now here, we have splittings that come from intrinsic spin orbit coupling. So we are going to take two of these monolayers. Uh, we are going to twist them on top of, on top of another. And we are going to see which kind of flat bands and which kind of correlations we can get when we encapsulate them in between a ferromagnet. So, so the basic idea is that uh, we can start with uh, a twisted dichalcogenide that doesn't have any spin orbit coupling. Uh, and in this case, we essentially get flat bands that are fourfold degenerate. So we have four bands at low energies. And if we now switch on spin orbit coupling, well, nothing remarkable happens. We get some splittings, but the low energy bands still have a four-fold degeneracy. Now, the idea is that we can put uh, ferromagnetic lids, one on top of, one above, and one below, either in a ferromagnetic configuration or in an anti-ferromagnetic configuration. And in the ferromagnetic configuration, we actually lift the degeneracy. In particular, we lift the spin degeneracy, and we get a low energy model that only has two bands. But the most interesting case is that in the anti-ferromagnetic configuration, we also lift the degeneracy, and now we get a state that has also two-fold degeneracy in comparison with the original four-fold degeneracy. So, so the idea is that the only thing that we have done is we've taken this uh, twisted uh, TMDC in between two ferromagnetic insulators, and by putting uh, this our ferromagnetic lids with two different configurations, we can change the uh, the degeneracy of the low energy bands. And for this, we are just uh, combining these three ingredients. We are combining just kinetic energy, we are combining spin, intrinsic spin orbit coupling of the TMDC, and we are combining exchange proximity effect. So the bottom line is that we essentially get to this. We start with a four-band model, and when we switch on 
the exchange couplings either in the anti-paramagnetic configuration or in the paramagnetic configuration, we go to a system that has a twofold degeneracy in the spin channel or a twofold degeneracy in the body channel. So uh, now the, the interesting thing is that of course we have a two one model. So the first thing that one would like to have is to have some low energy effective model to describe these flat times. And, and to, to get this model, so the first thing that one can do is to see where our states are localized. And it turns out that the low energy flat bands are localized in these zones with AD stacking in contrast with what we get with two-step brushing by layers. And uh, we actually can uh, capture all the physics of these low energy bands by using a two orbital model in a triangular lattice, but in which the hoppings have complex spaces. You know, the interesting idea is that these complex spaces of the hoppings are related with some topological properties of the twisted van der Waals material. And this is something that we can uh, actually uh, see by looking at the uh, real space flux uh, in the twisted Moray material. So we take our pi b model for the twisted Moray material and we compute what is the artificial gauge field that is created by this combination of twist exchange coupling and spin orbit coupling. And it turns out that this artificial gauge field is the one responsible for getting uh, complex phases in our triangular lattice model. And we can correlate exactly our triangular lattice model with this artificial gauge field that comes from the combination of all the ingredients that we had. Good, so now we have an effective model for our twisted system. Uh, so perhaps the last thing that we can try to look at is what happens when we put interactions in this system. So we have a uh, system that has twofold degeneracy, both in the paramagnetic and anti-paramagnetic configuration. And we, we do, what we do now is we assume that our system is half filled and we have electronic interactions. And for this, we simply take our tie bonding model describing the whole twisted Moray material that has several thousands of sites and we have first neighbors and second neighbors and on-site interactions. We solve it self-consistently using mean field and we look at what is the self-consistent band structure and what is the self-consistent uh, spin density and valley density in real space. So let's do that. So let, let's go first to the anti-formality configuration. We put in interactions, we solve it at the mean field level and what we get is that of course the two-fold degeneracy is broken because we expect a mod insulator in this regime and what we get is that uh, we get a spontaneous spin polarization that is induced by interactions. And of course, if you now look at the spin density in real space, you will see that this spontaneous spin polarization that has been created by interactions, it's exactly localized in the regions where your low energy states were. So this is somehow expected. So, but the, perhaps the, a, a more interesting case is the case of the ferromagnetic encapsulation. So in the ferromagnetic encapsulation, we can actually play the same game. We add interactions, we solve it at the mean field level, and we also see that we get a interaction-induced spin splitting of our bound structure. But now, uh, if we look in real space and we look at what are the expectation values that are induced by interactions, what we see is that a finite valley density develops. So valley gets, so we have a spontaneous valley symmetry breaking induced by interactions in this twisted data coaching So, So overall, the, the idea of this magnetically encapsulated twisted data coaching is fairly simple. You start with your two-fold degeneracy, you add electronic interactions, and depending on what was the origin of your original degeneracy, you may get some spontaneous spin symmetry breaking, or you can get some spontaneous valley symmetry breaking. And this is it. This is basically the way in which you can control what is the nature of your correlated state with the magnetic encapsulation. Just by changing the orientation of your ferromagnets that are above and below, you can go from spin symmetry breaking to valley symmetry breaking. So now let me tell you about the second story, about what happens when you put a twisted graphene by layer encapsulated in between two ferromagnetic and at this point, you, you might think, well, I mean, same, same thing may happen, right? I mean, twisted graphene bilayers are not so different from twisted dicotinite bilayers. And uh, I mean, that's, that's, of course, up to a certain degree true. So to try to make things a little bit more interesting, let me tell you about something else now. Let me tell you about something that is, uh, let's say, a little bit different. So what I want to talk about now is I want to tell you about frustration. 
And uh, please, at this point, don't get me wrong. I don't mean that I'm going to tell you about negative emotional frustration. The frustration that I want to talk about is a positive frustration. It's the frustration that we see in condensed matter physics. It's the frustration that we see, for example, in magnetism. So before, what I showed you was a system in which we had some spontaneous spin ferromagnetism or spontaneous valley ferromagnetism. But what I want to tell you now is that besides this valley ferromagnetism, we can also have something different. We can have a frustrated magnetism or a frustrated valley magnetism. And the question is, why would we be interested in valley magnetism or what would be in, why would we be interested in frustrated valley magnetism? And the reason is that if we think about what people know about frustrated magnetism, what we know is that in the best case scenario, if we have the, a, the proper frustrated system, we can get to something that is called a quantum spin state. That is a very interesting state in which we have macroscopic entanglement and in which our excitations have fractionalized. And of course, quantum spin liquids is something that, in, that people have been studying for many, many years. And there are many, many candidates uh, that are known or are suspected to have to show quantum spin liquid physics. But so inspired by this, what I want to tell you today is that perhaps we can do something similar with uh, two-state graphing layers. And in particular, we can do something similar just with the valley degree of freedom. So what I want to tell you now, or what I would like to suggest, is that perhaps in these two-state graphing layers, we may be able to get to a regime in which we get some valley frustrated magnetism, and in an optimal case, perhaps to a valley quantum spin liquid state. So this is the question that I want to answer now. How are we going to engineer valley frustrated states in twisted graphing by the ears. And to answer this question, I'm going to, to start with a uh, fairly simple system. So let, let's start with twisted graphing by layer, uh, in particular, a little bit above the magic angle. And I'm going to encapsulate this twisted graphing by layer in between two ferromagnetic insulators. And for the sake of simplicity, let us just focus on the anti-formality configuration that is actually the optimal one to get this valley frustrated state in this system. So again, our Hamiltonian is going to consist on, let's say, three different terms. First one is the kinetic energy. That is the conventional tie banding model with several thousands of atoms per unit cell. That's the one responsible for uh, flat bands and all the phenomenology that we know in two state graphing by layers. We are going to have also exchange proximity effect that comes from a second order process to the ferromagnet. And we are also going to have pressure spring orbit coupling in the two layers that comes from the local mirror symmetry breaking induced by the ferromagnet. And the regime in which we are going to focus is this regime that is a little bit above the magic angle, so something between 1.3 and 2 degrees. So let's start with the simplest case, which is uh, twisted graphing by layer without any kind of ferromagnet or anti uh, yeah, without any kind of ferromagnet above and below. Uh, and if you look at the regime with of two degrees or so, what we know is that we essentially have a uh, renormalized Girakon, so Girakon in which the Fermi velocity is a little bit smaller than for first thing graphene. And, uh, and, and these states are, uh, let's say, localized around the AA region, of course. So let's now move on to what happens when we uh, turn on or when we put experimentally our ferromagnetic lids. So if we put these uh, two anti ferromagnetic lids, let's say one above and another one below, with, uh, let's say, an anti ferromagnetic configuration, we essentially get that the exchange field uh, creates a splitting in our band. So initially, we had some clear cones. Now we have a uh, valley ends independent splitting in our, in our band structure. So this is just with exchange field. We have not considered spin orbit coupling so far. And at this point, you would say, well, this is truly not too interesting because the bands are still uh, fairly dispersive. So it, would not be possible to get a correlated state here. And that's absolutely right. But this situation dramatically changes when you actually turn on spin orbit coupling. So when you turn on spin orbit coupling, that's essentially the figure on the right that you see, the highly dispersive bands that you had on the left actually become pretty flat. So you get flat bands in, above the magic angle when you combine both spin orbit coupling and exchange fields created by your two ferromagnetic lids. So, and again, once we have flat bands, uh, the first thing that we want is to have a, a low energy effective model. 
Uh, and it turns out that these flat bands are actually very well captured, very well captured by a, an effective model in the triangular lattice that has both first neighbor and second neighbor hoppings. And the interesting thing is that, again, these hoppings, both the first neighbor and the second neighbor, they are actually complex hoppings. And again, we can relate these complex hoppings, and in particular, the, um, let's say, the phase of these complex hoppings to some artificial gauge field in the super lattice. So we play a, a similar game as before. We compute what is the real space density of artificial gauge field, and in particular, the valley gauge field that's created by the combination of twist, Reichert spin orbit coupling, and exchange field. And what we see is that we have regions of the space that have positive artificial gauge field and other regions that have negative artificial gauge field. And we can exactly correlate the different phases with this uh, real space density of artificial gauge field. So, well, now we have a low energy effective model. And of course, the natural step now is to add interactions and see what happens with these quasi flat bands when we create interaction. And for, for the sake of concreteness, let us now focus here on the strong coupling regime. So in the, on the regime in which the electronic interactions are, uh, let's say, the same range or even bigger than your bandwidth, that it's pretty much, much what we expect or realistic parameters in this regime. So essentially in this limit, uh, one can expect that uh, if this flat band model plus interactions can be mapped to an Heisenberg model and in particular to a valley Heisenberg model because the degeneracy of our low energy bands is only on the valley degree of freedom. The spin degree of freedom has been completely lifted by the combination of rush spin orbit coupling and exchange field. So uh, we, we, we can do this mapping and we can uh, uh, check how the different exchange couplings and in particular the symmetric exchange, the uh, an isotropic exchange, and the anti-symmetric exchange depend on parameters. And of course, the simplest parameter to tune in a twisted 2D material is the bias between the layers. So we see how these different parameters uh, change with the bias between the layers, and we actually observe that we essentially realize a frustrated uh, Bali Heisenberg model whose interactions we can effectively control with the interlayer bias. And, uh, and the important thing to note here is that the, uh, the change in numbers that we can get with realistic interlayer bias are remarkable. So, and of course, it's hard to know at this uh, stage in which regime we are going to have a valley quantum spin liquid state. But uh, since we are, have this capability of tuning the degrees of freedom so much, one can be optimistic and think that perhaps in some of these uh, points of the phase diagram, we will be able to get some interesting valley spin liquid state. But of course, the, the simplest scenario to, to have here would be to just have a conventional valley frustrated state in which we have a valley spiral. Uh, and if we wanted to detect that valley spiral in a realistic experiment, the simplest way uh, to do this is essentially by doing some non-local transport with valley currents. So you could, you could take a, a valley spiral in the middle, put two systems that have valley hall effect and inverse valley hall effect as, for example, to, uh, a align by layer graphene with an interlayer bias, and by doing a non-local conductance measurement, you can see whether if you have a valley spiral that creates intervalley mixing and kills your non-local signal, or if you have valley conservation in your intermediate part and you get a uh, non-local signal. So this is simply uh, following the same idea of um, spin hall effect and inverse spin hall effect, but just now with uh, the valley degree of freedom. And in the last two minutes, let me tell you uh, about something that is not physics. Uh, something that, I mean, perhaps from the physical point of view is not so interesting, but perhaps for students can be pretty interesting. So of course, when looking at this just the materials, one has to uh, compute their, uh, let's say, code their own type one in Hamiltonian, but at some point you may want to reproduce something that somebody else has done. And for this, uh, I created a, a user interface in which you can uh, essentially put any well, not any, but different kinds of type bonding models with spin orbit coupling, interactions, exchange fields, uh, magnetic fields, and so forth. And you can look at uh, band structures, density of states, uh, topological invariants, and so forth. And of course, one simple way of showing you this is by showing you 
a simple example in which one essentially computes uh, four different models, uh, let's say putting uh, perhaps subliding balance or magnetic fields or right resting orbit coupling. And then you say, all right, please show me the demand structure, show me the density of states, show me the topological invariant, show me the real space, local density of states and so forth. And of course, you can also do this with two-step graphing by layers. And for example, with magnetic angle two-step uh, graphing by layers. And in, in this case, you can, for example, access, uh, look at this structure, well, how we ha you have the different stackings in your structure. You can look at your band structure and see that you have your flat bands. You can look at what is the location of the uh, density of states in real space at different energies, or you can look at how your Fermi surface changes with the different energies. And of course, you can also look at twisted tri layers, twisted by by layers, twisted by tri layers, twisted tri tetra by. Well, I think that you you get the idea. Um, so with this, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention, and please remember that uh, in magnetically encapsulated twisted 2D materials offer a platform to control the microscopic degrees of freedom of correlated states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. That, that was uh, very cool. Uh, very nice talk. Um, as far as I can see, uh, there's uh, no questions yet. Um, but, but I also got kicked out for a minute by my internet during your talk. <laughs> so, so if people have questions, you know, don't be shy and, and, and type them into the chat and, and I will read them out. But in the meantime, um, I'll make a start. Um, and and I, I was wondering um, when you were talking about this when, with the structure where you have the both pointing in the same and pointing in the opposite direction, uh, is there an intuitive way of, of saying of, 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 of understanding why one should couple to spin and the other one should couple to valley? Could could you could you in hindsight at least rationalize rationalize this without yeah. sort of a complicated calculation? Yeah. So in, in the case of the ferromagnetic configuration, you can think that this is effectively as if you were applying a magnetic field and essentially lifting the spin degeneracy. So that is, let's say, the simplest case to, to understand. So you, you can think that, yeah, format configuration essentially creates a spin splitting in your formats. So initially, you have four, you get your greater spin splitting, you get two. Uh, in the anti ferromagnetic case, uh, that's a little bit more complicated to, to understand. Uh, and I would say that there's not a simple argument to, to understand that one. Uh, I mean, you can understand from symmetry that in that case, you are going to lift the other degree of freedom. Uh, but of course, you don't, you don't know for sure that you, would, you were going to get so isolated uh, two-fold degenerate bands. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so there is a question from uh, Unmesh Gorai, and he's asking, can you explain again about the valley spiral? Yeah, so, so the idea is that, uh, I mean, you have a super lattice and you have, let's say, AA regions in which you have a local valley degree of freedom, and valley is a Pauli matrix. Right? You have Pauli matrices that are associated with Pauli, and we usually think about the Pauli matrix in the C direction, which essentially is I am in Pauli K or I am in Pauli K prime. But you also have the other two Pauli two, uh, Pauli matrices, so you can think that my Pauli, instead of pointing in the up direction, is pointing in the X direction, which is some specific Pauli mixing, or that it's pointing in the Y direction, that it's another specific Pauli mixing. So essentially, the idea is that you have a super lattice in which interactions create one specific valley mixing in the region of space, another specific valley mixing in this other region of space, and so forth. And if you look at that, you essentially get a spin, a valley spiral. Okay. Okay, that seemed to answer the question. <laughs> um, I was also wondering about when, when you create these real space models, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they are like, you know, a one realization of your, of your K-space Hamiltonian. Is that correct? When, when you sort of... No, we kind of start with a real space type and model. So in the case of graphene, you essentially take the structure and you put, let's say, PC orbitals in each point where you have a carbon atom. Right. Uh, and in the case of, of dichroic cogenides, you essentially take some kind of uh, honeycomb lattice in which you put both charge order and spin orbit coupling. So you oh, so directly from real space, let's say. 
Okay, so these real space models that you were writing down, they were still atomistic models. Yeah, they were atomistic models. I see, but with yeah. the, with the, with the uh, encapsulation integrated out, essentially. Yeah, ex ex exactly. So we don't put the degrees of freedom of the encapsulation. We essentially say that the encapsulation creates an effective exchange coupling and an effective Reichsbahn in orbit coupling on the degrees of freedom of the material that is encapsulated. I see. Okay, so there uh, is an... Two other questions, one from uh, Amilcar Bedoya Pinto. And he says, questions of a twistronic newcomer. Why are the magic angles of twisted bilayer graphene and twisted bilayer tungsten diselenide so close if the band structure, one Dirac and one gap semiconductor are so different? Yes, yeah, so that, that's of course a, a very interesting point. So in the case of graphene, one can let's say, easily estimate at which angle one gets the magic angle that is essentially a, uh, a ratio between, uh, let's say, the uh, distance moment of space between your uh, Dirac points and then your interlayer coupling. And those are, let's say, two, let's say, two energy scales or two, dis let's say, two wavelength scales that you can easily, uh, let's say, estimate. And if you just say, oh, my interlayer coupling is 300 MeV, for which angle I would get a split in that it exactly gives me flat times. So for twisted bilayer graphene, it's fairly easy. In the case of twisted dicalcogenides, apart from that, one also gets some uh, strong relaxations on the structure. Uh, but it, it turns out that the magic angles appear in, let's say, sim similar ranges. So the only difference is that for twisted dicalcogenides, one gets, let's say, a continuum of magic angles. So once you go below a certain threshold, your bands are pretty flat most of the time. Whereas in twisted bilayer, you get, let's say, some very specific angles at which they are the flattest. Uh, so I'd say that there's not an easy answer of why they happen at similar angles. Uh, but you, you, can, you can think that generically, when you have twisted materials for relatively small angles, you are always going to get flat moments. And another question from Bruno Amorim. Uh, he's asking, is the coupling between twisted bilayer graphene and the ferromagnetic layers sensitive to the twist angle between the twisted bilayer graphene and the ferromagnet? That, that's a very good question. So, I mean, what we assume so far is that uh, there's no twist angle between the uh, twisted bilayer graphene and the ferromagnet. So we assume that the coupling between the ferromagnet and the twisted bilayer is kind of uniform in space. So we choose a uniform exchange coupling in space and we choose a uniform induced Reichsbach in orbit coupling in, in space. Of course, one could have some, let's say, moiré effect from the ferromagnetic leads. Uh, in the same way as one gets, let's say, more effects from the boron nitride for encapsulated twisted bilayers, but we haven't considered that so far. But that's, a, of course, a very interesting question. Um, maybe a related question. Um, what's, what's the um, status, experimental status with these systems? I mean, with, with the chromium iodide and, you know, graphene multilayers. Yeah. Uh, so are, are there experiments yet? Yeah, so th there are several experiments on chromium graphene on top of chromium iodine, for example, and I mentioned some, some of them in one of these slides. So there are, let's say, magnetic junctions between uh, chromium iodine and graphene, or well, graphite in particular, that's, that show, let's say, very high uh, magnetic resistance. There are also experiments of uh, monolayer twisted dicalcogen, monolayer dicalcogenides on top of chromium bromide, I think it is. Uh, so. So experiments of, let's say, graphene and, and dicalcogenides on chromium iodine and chromium bromide, there are already some of them. Uh, I am not aware of any involving twisted graphene or twisted dicalcogenides with this uh, uh, 2D ferromagnetic materials. But I mean, for example, I mean, of course, I'm not an experimentalist, but I would say that if they manage to put monolayer, perhaps putting bilayer is still the bubble. Okay, so so these are, in other words, these are true predictions, and uh, yeah, any experimentalist listening in is encouraged to uh, <laughs> yeah, to do some yeah, exactly. And of course, there can be, let's say, some difficult things in, in these systems, but in principle, I'd say that they may not be impossible. Okay, fair enough. All right, uh, I think we're, we're out of time. So thanks again very much, uh, Jose. This this was a very good start for the session. Yeah. And uh, next up is uh, Cherk uh, Benshop. Um, with a contributed talk. Um, so, uh, yes. okay, can you share your screen? I'll try to share my screen.
Yeah, that works. Perfect. Visible, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe let's wait just a little bit uh, until um, you know uh, until it's uh, nine ten, and then okay. we can can get started. Okay. Uh, but but everything's working. All right. Perfect. perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, but before I start my talk, uh, which is about homogeneity in twisted bilateral vein devices. Uh, I would first like to acknowledge the people who made this work possible. So we uh, collaborated strongly with the, the group at ICFO by Dimitri Efetov, and they are basically responsible fabri for fabricating the devices which we used in this study. And furthermore, I would like to thank the group of Sensian van der Molen, in particular Tobias de Jong, uh, who helped tremendously in developing some of the mathematics I'm about to talk about today. Uh, and finally, then, of course, the funding agencies who pay my salary and uh, who paid for my instrument, which I used. Uh, so then, uh, twisted bilegraphene, uh, I will not introduce it fully, but uh, as you probably already all know, uh, there is a plethora of strongly correlated electronic phases happening uh, at multi multiple twist angles, uh, both below these magic angles, but also above these magic angles. Uh, but the issue I want to talk about today is basically that uh, even though we are supposedly two very similar devices, and, and what I mean by that is the twist angles are supposedly very similar. So as you can see here in this data, uh, twist angle is supposedly 1.04 and here 1.05. Like the properties that, in my opinion, define a superconductor, so, or the characteristics, so the critical temperature or uh, the critical current, uh, they, they can vary quite a lot between these devices. And so the question is, why is there so much var variability between these devices, even though they are supposedly very similar in terms of twist angles? And since I come for, oh, since I have my background in scanning tunneling microscopy, I think it makes sense to then ask the question, how homogeneous are these devices at different length scales? And to answer that question, of course, it would be nice to have a method to actually quantify this, this meaning of homogeneity uh, on all length scales. So uh, we basically launched a project uh, to try to, to answer this uh, question. And uh, as I said, we do a scanning tunneling microscopy. But one thing I really should point out now, which is different from the devices uh, or, or on the data on the devices which I showed you before, is we now need to scan open twisted bilegraphene devices. And what I mean by an open device is just that the, the top HBN layer, which is usually there to encapsulate the twisted bilayer part, is now missing. And this means that we can bring our uh, scanning uh, probe very close to the sample, and this allows us to then measure the tunneling current. So, but this also brings with it yet another question because scanning tunneling microscopy has been performed before now and, and actually quite a lot of groups has, have managed to successfully uh, do this kind of experiment on these devices. But one thing that's quite peculiar is that so far we haven't really seen any uh, hints of or signatures of superconductivity in these open twisted bioelectrophene devices. And then of course it's quite suggestive to then think that well the big difference between these devices and the, the transport devices is to stop encapsulating HBN layer. So maybe this layer somehow stabilizes twisted bilayer graphene and that would then indicate or that would imply then that the twisted bilayer in open devices is maybe more inhomogeneous and therefore superconductivity cannot be established. And so spoiler alert, uh, at the end of the talk you will see that this is not the case at all actually. Uh, but this is the question we try to answer with our work. So, as I said, we need a way to characterize inhomogeneity in twisted bilegraphene devices. Um, and if you do STM on one of such devices, then you can get data which sort of looks like this. So here we clearly see a moray pattern. Um, and here I would like to uh, point out previous work done in the group of Abhay Pasupati. Um, so they already established a method to, uh, to basically to measure your twist angle and to also take into account this inhomogeneity. So what you have is if you have a data set like this, uh, then you can measure the Moray period and the Moray period is uh, related to the twist angle. So if you measure this, you can get at your uh, twist angle, but you can imagine that if there is some sort of strain uh, or intrinsic strain in your twisted pilar, then the sides that make up uh, this Moray or yeah, the, the Moray lattice no longer needs to be isotropic in all directions. So that means that the sides of this triangle no longer need to be equidistant um, but this was taken into account in a, a model proposed by this group. Um, and then if you do some calculation, you can get out your average twist angle. And furthermore, you can get out an angle which specifies the axis 
uh, of the of, of strain, and then there is an epsilon parameter which actually indicates the magnitude of this uh, strain. Um, but as time evolves, uh, we are becoming better and better at scanning these kind of devices, um, and also uh, hugely in part uh, thanks to the, the group at ICFO, we are now able to scan uh, much larger feet of views because devices are overall uh, much cleaner, and. This also allows us now to, to introduce a new method uh, to more continuously characterize homogeneity, on, even on smaller length scales. Um, and we call this method the spatial lock-in method. Um, and those of you familiar with maybe the Lollevita algorithm, if you're familiar with STM, there is a Lollevita algorithm uh, which is used for a drift correction. Uh, or if you have a, maybe a background in electron microscopy, there is some field called geometric phase analysis. And both of these techniques uh, use similar mathematics as what we will use uh, in our algorithm. Uh, so you might rec recognize stuff from there. So uh, the spatial lock-in algorithm is basically based upon comparing your measured lattice with a pristine, unstrained ideal lattice. Uh, and then the key of this algorithm will be to find some sort of tra transformation from your ideal lattice to your measurement lattice or vice versa. And then this transformation tells you something about the intrinsic strain that is present in your device. So uh, I'm not a theorist, I'm an experimentalist, but if we very simply consider an ideal lattice as just a sum of, of cosines, then we can also consider our measured lattice also as a sum of cosines, but now in the presence of a so-called displacement field, which is here indicated by a U. And the key of our algorithm will now be to figure out what the specific displacement field is for a certain data set we obtain. How do we do this? Uh, well, it's already in the name, it's, it's a lock-in based method. So first of all, what we do is uh, here, I just have some artificially generated data with a little bit of straining. Uh, the first thing you do is you, you Fourier transform, uh, then you can extract your reference frequencies by, by fitting a Gaussians to the uh, Brach peaks. You generate your reference signal, uh, which I should point out, which is a uh, complex signal. So here I just show you the real part. You multiply your data with your reference signal, uh, and then the real part can, for example, look somewhat like this. Uh, and the final step you then do is you, you low pass filter, uh, and then the argument at every pixel, so the argument of each complex number, basically gives you the local phase. And this you can do for multiple reference signals, basically in all directions of your lattice. So why is this phase important? Well, I'm not going to show you explicitly, but uh, the phase is basically related to your displacement field. So uh, here I show you the expression I showed you before. And then if you write on your phase as the dot product of your uh, wave factor with your displacement field, you can already see the two are related. But, uh, and this is just some elementary expression. Hopefully everybody has seen at some point in his or her life. Um, but so, the key is to find these local, uh, the local phase, and this gives us the local displacement field. But then it turns out that it's actually more useful not to look at the local displacement field, but to look at something which is known in continuum mechanics as the deformation gradient tensor. And this is nothing more as the gradient of this local displacement field. Um, why is this useful? Well, this transformation is literally, it tells you how an infinitesimal triangle uh, in your ideal case transforms to your measured case or vice versa. Um, and then what we do is actually we do a polar decomposition of this tensor. Um, and how should we think of this? Well, I think I showed you this graphic before, but it's useful to think of this in sort of steps of transformations from your ideal lattice to your measured case, where the V matrix is just a simple rotation. And then all the really useful uh, physics, I would say, is encoded in D, which is a diagonal scaling matrix. And uh, this matrix basically tells us how does the local density of Moiré lattice sites change from the ideal case to the measured case. And since the uh, density of Moiré lattice sites is proportional to the twist angle, uh, this is where the information about the twist angle is encoded. And furthermore, uh, D, the, uh, by taking the ratio of the elements that make up D, you can say something about the local lattice anis anisotropy. So that was a whole lot of technical stuff, uh, but. Basically, what you need to take away from this is now that we have a method to locally, so at every pixel, put a number on a twist angle and a degree of anisotropy. So let's actually then apply this to some data. 
Uh, I already showed you the image before probably, but uh, first device is a device with an average twist angle of 2.02 degrees. And by average twist angle, I mean the twist angle you obtain by measuring uh, the Moray lattice uh, by just taking the Fourier transform of your image and then you can average over all of your bracket peaks. So a typical output of the algorithm then looks somewhat like this. So here is in the, the data set, the light blue circle uh, in the picture indicates the size of the uh, filter we use in the lock-in step. Um, and well, here we have chosen it roughly on the order of two uh, Moray periods. And you can go a little bit smaller, but at some point you have to take into account that if you in real space choose a very small filter, then in frequency space it becomes quite large and then you get leakage of uh, other peaks in your filter window, which you don't want. So we can detect variations roughly on this length scale. And then uh, let's look at the top right image. So this is then the local twist angle map we get out. So as you can see, uh, there is so in the background some, some small variations, but also the algorithm is able to pick up on some much brighter feature, which by eye is not necessarily that visible in the data. But it's good to see that uh, the lock-in is a very sensitive method, so we are able to pick up on these kind of signals. Then in the bottom left, uh, I plot the kappa parameter, which is nothing more than the ratio between the elements that make up this D matrix. So kappa is a degree of anisotropy of the lattice. Um, and a kappa of one means the lattice is isotropic. A kappa bigger than one means there is some degree of anisotropy. Uh, but this all looks very similar to actually the twist angle map, where there is some much brighter feature and smaller variations in the background. Uh, then psi is the angle corresponding to the uh, lattice anisotropy. Uh, so you can sort of think about this angle as uh, the angle uh, I showed you before in the work of Pasupati. And it just indicates the direction of the local anisotropy. Uh, but then we also wanted to couple back to what has been done before. Um, and then what you can do, uh, which also I unfortunately don't have time to show you, but instead of looking at the displacement field of the Moray lattice, you can look at the relative displacement field between the individual uh, graphene sheets that make up the bilayer. Then you can do your decomposition and then you can actually get out exactly this epsilon parameter that is used uh, in the previous work and also used by some theorists now. Uh, but again, the patterns all look very similar. Uh, so then this method now allows us to put a number on local anisotropy and the local twist angle at every pixel. And standard thing you can do then, for example, is just calculate what is my standard deviations of these numbers in the field of view I have, which here is approximately 300 nanometer or so. Um, and then we get out the standard deviation in twist angle for 0.04 degrees. And for this epsilon parameter, the standard deviation is 0.09%. And what does this actually mean? Uh, and this is where it becomes very interesting, at least to me. Uh, because if we, if we compare now to, to previous studies, so this is uh, work done in the group of uh, Zeldov, uh, and they do scanning squid on tip. And because they measure magnetic fields, they are actually able to scan uh, encapsulated devices and what they can do is then by scanning the magnetic field locally also uh, put a number on the local twist angle but it turns out actually that for these encapsulated devices uh, the standard deviation is 0.039 which is extremely similar as the standard deviation we get in a non-encapsulated devices so it turns out that in terms of homogeneity actually uh, encapsulated and non-encapsulated devices might not be that far apart uh, and then of course this begs the question why did we not see uh, clear signatures of superconductivity yet in open uh, twisted bilayer graphene devices? And yeah, there might be multiple reasons for that, but it might suggest at least a critical role for this, this top HBN uh, layer. Then uh, the second number I showed you was the, the standard deviation in this epsilon parameter. And to put this in a little bit more context, uh, I would also compare to previous work of others. So what you can do is basically uh, do some uh, tight binding continuum model and then you can calculate uh, what happens to my bond structure if I, if I strain my lattice. And then it turns out that for an uh, epsilon of uh, 0.1, you can already get the extra splitting of your Van Hoof singularities by roughly 5 milli electron volt. And now what's quite interesting is that you can also uh, basically put a number on this Van Hoof splitting for the twist angle. So uh, here I show you some work done in the group of Eva Andrei, and she measured for different uh, twisted bilayer graphene, uh, not devices, but uh, for areas with different twist angles. She basically measures the Van Hoof splitting. So you can also put a number on the uh, Van Hoof splitting 
in terms of twist angle. And it, and it turns out that if you do this for these two numbers, then it turns out that both contributions should, should give you of an whole splitting of approximately five milli electron volt. So what I mean to say by that is that it's not only the inhomogeneity in twist angle, but also the degree of local lattice anisotropy. Both of them should basically equally contribute to the final deformations in the band structure, which we should observe. So I just showed you now these numbers for one device. Uh, of course, we scan multiple devices. Uh, yeah, I don't think I will go into too much detail, but just know that the, the variations we get out are all of similar uh, order of magnitude. And then finally, I showed you this slide before, and as I said, the key of this algorithm is to, to measure basically this displacement field. Uh, but one thing that's a little bit tricky is that this displacement field not only contains the intrinsic strain of the device, but it also contains any thermal drift you might have over your measurement or some piezo symmetry which might be present to your instrument. So it's basically my job to then exclude these artifacts or at least to prove that the contribution uh, of uh, its intrinsic strain is, is much bigger than these other two artificial, uh, yeah, than these other two artifacts. And to do that, I, I just measured multiple, uh, I kept scanning the same field field multiple times. So they're scanned subsequently and at different scan speeds. And then here, what you can see is that luckily the output is, is almost exactly the same for all of these uh, data sets. Major differences sometimes appear, but usually that's due to small uh, tip instabilities, for example, uh, which means that we do in fact measure the intrinsic device homogeneity and not artifacts. So then uh, I'd like to wrap up actually. Uh, so what I did or what I showed in this work is that we have introduced a new method for now continuously mapping homogeneity of uh, moray materials. And using this untwisted biography, we've actually found that the homogeneity of open devices is very comparable to the homogeneity of encapsulated devices. And this suggests a very critical role for this top HBN uh, layer, at least maybe for establishing superconductivity. Uh, and then finally, the, the degree of LEDs in homogeneity at present in these devices uh, and the degree of local uh, lattice uh, or twist angle in homogeneity should give an equal contribution to bun structure effects. At least that's what the numbers say us now, tell us now. And then uh, some similar self-promotion. Uh, we recently put out this archive in which you can read all of this uh, if you are interested. And then thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you uh, for, for this very interesting talk. We uh, have a little time for question left, um, but um, I guess they are, they are none yet in the chat. So uh, feel free to, to type your questions in the chat. In the meantime, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. Oh, there is one. Um, I'll, I'll start with, with that one from uh, Unmesh Gorai. And he has two questions. Uh, part one, what is the bright line in the spatial lock-in data? Yeah, what it is exactly is a very good question. Uh, I, I mean, it appears in our output, but as you can see in the topograph, it's, it's not that clear at all. Um, so actually, we're not that sure. Part two, can you mm -hmm. quantify typical standard deviation theta value for which one can get good correlated states? Uh, what do you mean by good correlated states? Uh, well, I mean, correlated insulator states, I guess. I guess he's asking what, what kind of... Uh, so, uh, yeah. I think it's, for me, it would be difficult because most of the experiments I did, as you could see, uh, is not on devices close to the magic angle. So, and also I don't have a lot of spectroscopic data on these devices. So we never measured correlated insulating states on these devices. I apologize for that. Fair enough. Uh, Okay, I think I have still time to, for me to ask a quick question. And, uh, and basically, uh, you're, you're saying it's your original hypothesis that, it, that the role of the boron nitride was in stabilizing the structure of the twisted bilayer, that that was incorrect. Yeah. And, but now you're saying it's got to be something else about the boron nitride that, that is important. And yeah. any, any, any ideas what it could be? <laughs> well, I know my, uh, our collaborators, Dimitri Eftov, I know he, did some work on, for example, the distance of the HOPG back rate, which is usually present in these devices. So the distance from this back rate to the twisted bilayer feed itself. And uh, because then you basically change the screening in the bilayer. Uh, and this can also, well, this influences the 
local electronic structure also a lot in this pie layer. So that's one parameter which needs to be investigated. Um, but because this is not yet been carefully done, uh, we don't really can say superconductivity is not present in open twisted bile like affinity devices yet. I see, but you're suggesting somehow it could have to do with screening, uh, for example. Yeah, for example. Uh, okay. Uh, well, thanks very much. Um, uh, there, there is another question, but unfortunately we're out of time, so maybe you can answer it in the chat. Um, I will try. And, uh, and uh, well, thanks again. And next speaker is Tobias Stauber. So Tobias, if you can uh, share your screen, that'd be great. Okay. Yep. All right. Do you hear me? Yes. We hear you. All right. So um, let me start um, by thanking the organizers for putting up this, setting up this program and for giving me the possibility to, to present our work here. Um, I'm talking about chirality in twisted bilayer graphene and let me define what I mean by chirality. Um, this um, notion is now really from the original meaning of the word and it comes from the Greek word hand and it means that this is a three-dimensional object whose mirror image does not match the original. So um, it is important to stress since we are always working with quasi 2D systems that this effect I'm going to talk about is entirely due to the extension in the third dimension. So it's really a three-dimensional effect. And um, normally different enantiomers um, cannot be distinguished. They are totally equal in density, eigenfrequencies, and, and so on. But the only possibility to, to distinguish them is really by the interaction of another chiral object. And um, usually, I mean, the most prominent chiral object is probably circularly polarized light, where you propagate um, light and the polarization plane is changing with the propagation. So you can see here that this is here um, rotating um, in, in the E field. So um, the, the X and Y components are, are kind of um, rotating um, with respect to each other. And you can quantify this chirality by this formula here. This is a density which can actually also be attributed a, a flux and you can um, formulate a continuity equation. And um, it makes sense, this result, so it's proportional to the intensity of the light and also to the frequency. So, so the faster you, you, you rotate around, the, the more chiral your object is. Now, um, Again, if you want to measure this, um, the, the different enantiomers, um, you have to go beyond this dipole approximation, you have to go into the third dimension. You have to introduce this additional scale here. And um, so the typical scale, the dimension as qu quantity here is K times A. And K is the wave number, A is the, the dimension of the chiral molecule. And usually this is a very small number. In, in real um, setups, it's actually even smaller um, using um, terahertz light or um, um, near infrared, um, far infrared. So it's, it's even smaller. And so the, the circular dichroism is related to this dimensional scale. And it's usually a small number. So it's the difference between the um, um, absorption cross-section of plus and minus um, circularly polarized light. Now the, the dream would be um, to, to make this really a large quantity. So to have a very large um, circular dichroism of the order of unity. And um, is this possible? Well, you, you, you can do it either way. You can make the chiral object, the chiral molecule larger, and then of course you match the two scales which are totally um, different and you can kind of match them and, and make it larger. And the other direction would be to, to make chiral, small, um, to, uh, chiral light smaller. So you squeeze in light. And this is actually what I would like to propose here and what I will um, show that is possible with um, these twisted um, structures using this inherent chirality um, that is, that is um, given. 
Now, um, I'm talking about this because it has been measured in the far field. So um, here you see the different um, absorption cross-section of either left or right-handed um, light. And you see that there are differences at certain finite frequencies. And this was done by the Park Group. And um, a nice um, theoretical explanation was given by Luis Bray, um, Leonard Chico, and Eric Morel. Um, we were interested now, is there also a signature of this um, far field effect in the near field? Is, is there also some transport signature um, of this chirality of graphene? And um, for that, we were looking at the conductivity tensor. And when you look at a usual 2D systems and at the conductivity tensor, well, it's a two times two tensor. It's it's, it's rather simple object. And usually you don't see any optical activity because Maxwell equations are reciprocal. And in order to see it, you have to break some symmetries. And usually what is done is you break um, time reversal symmetry, then you introduce these whole terms here. And um, this gives then rise to a Faraday rotation and which can be very large in, in, a, in a strong magnetic field. Um, the other way um, would be to break rotation asymmetry. Then you have a birefringent system. So you have a different conductivity in X direction than in Y direction. And then by rotating the system, actually also non-diagonal terms appear here. And this gives rise to also um, optical um, activity. But um, you can clearly see that um, without breaking anything, you just have a conductivity tensor, which is proportional to the to the, to the normal um, unit matrix, and there's no optical conductivity. So the only way to obtain um, chiral um, um, signals is to break this two-dimensionality. This is what I um, stressed in the beginning. So this is really a three-dimensional effect. And the minimal model, so you can increase the model, of course, and, and then and include more effect. But the, the minimal model would include um, a four times four matrix, which has in the first two layers, the one layer. You can see here the conductivity tensor is totally trivial here. And in the second layer, it's also trivial. But the coupling in between those two layers, this can become non-trivial. And as you can see, this, um, can um, result in a term which is similar to a, a whole conductivity, which gives rise then to this optical um, activity. Now, um, what we have to do is we have to calculate um, now the, the current response function, and we have to do this for different layers and different um, directions. So in total, there are 16 of these quantities, but you can show by symmetries that only three of them are really different. So one is this in-plane conductivity, and the other one is the covalent drag between the layers. So you have one current in one layer, which is dragging another current in the same direction in the other layer. And um, well, this is all may be known from, especially from the Coulomb drag. Um, this is now not due to Coulomb interaction, but due to the covalent um, um, hopping, inter, inter, interplane hopping. But what is not present in these, in these um, double layer systems usually observed um, previously um, is this chiral coupling term. And this is really a quantum mechanical coupling um, induced by this interband, interlayer coupling um, between the two layers. And this induces a, a, a correlation between a current in X and one layer to the current in Y and the other layer. So this is um, the, the new ingredient. Um, okay, so um, of course, um, we have to calculate now these quantities and they could have been zero, but it um, turned out not to be. And um, they have to be zero at the neutrality point due to, to symmetry. So if you have an approximate electron hole symmetry, it has to be zero. But then it is um, positive for um, hole doping. And it turns out to be negative for electron doping. Um, so this is um, changing sign just as um, the, in, in the quantum Hall effect. And therefore, it's, um, we call it the longitudinal Hall effect because it gives rise to a longitudinal current 
which is proportional um, to this quantity when you apply an in-plane magnetic field. And you can also see that this is proportional to A, and A denotes the distance between the two layers. And you can see if the distance is now artificially reduced to zero, so to a truly two-dimensional system, this whole effect vanishes to be. Um, all right, so in, there seems to be a, um, a, a clear correlation between the chirality of the underlying atomic system and the electronic system. Um, this means that if you um, switch now the twist angle from plus six degrees to minus six degrees, you just swap in these, um, these curves. And um, this was reasonably to be expected, but um, interestingly, across the magic angle now, um, there will be a sign change, a change in chirality, which is now decoupling the underlying crystallographic chirality um, um, from the electronic one. So let me show you this movie I'm very proud of having produced myself. Um, so here you see different twist angles and this chiral nature and we are approaching the magic angle and now at the magic angle this is almost flat. So um, this is really now um, a, a change in chirality and it becomes zero at one certain angle. And notice the scale also. This is not reduced to the, to the flat band regime, but it goes far uh, above. So it's, it's also including the remote bands where this change of chirality can be observed. And when you now go to smaller angles beyond the magic angle, you have this switch um, of, of this chirality. Now, um, we, we looked at this in, in more detail and um, so um, it was um, important for us to realize that this quantity I, I was discussing is actually related to a simple um, generalized density of states. So here you have the formula for the density of states, but now you have a kernel and this chirality is now related to the vector product of the sheet current of layer one with the sheet current of layer two. For the type binding model, model there's, there's some, some, some additional um, simple um, extension, but in basic, in, in basically, this is really a simple um, formula and you can actually test now um, by, by easily um, this, this chirality in, in any system. And this is now the comparison between the, the um, density of states and this chiral um, quantity. As you can see, the density of states has here this um, um, strong enhancement um, at the magic angle, but it is only limited to the flat band regime. And here you, you have these black lines that are always indicating, indicating a sign change, okay? So you have the sign change always at the neutrality point, but then you also have these vertical lines here and this, um, extends to, to very large um, doping levels. And um, this would be a novel um, definition of the magic angle um, where the chirality changes um, sign. Now you can see there's a dome and there's also a sign change here and here. And so we were trying to link this to, to some symmetry. And, and we, came, we came up to the following. So we looked at the um, chirality, so at the um, band um, of Kx minus the band, band energy of minus Kx. And um, so if this is zero, um, you would actually have a mirror symmetry recovered. So you would have an emergency six symmetry. And this is indeed the case um, at this magic angle I equals 30. So 1.08 degrees. So this is um, very, very, very precise symmetry here. Interestingly, you also have an approximate symmetry here at this um, angle, 50, and at this one. Um, and these are actually corresponding to the domes here and here. So there seems to be some kind of relation with an emergency six or approximate C6 symmetry. Nevertheless, the cancellation is highly non-trivial. So this is the density plot of the lowest band 
and um, and this the what is called uh, what is plotted here is the kernel so this um, vector product of the sheet kerns and you can see that when you sum around the the fermi um, surface then there's always a cancellation between plus and minus plus and minus so it's a highly non-trivial cancellation that leads to a vanishing um, um, chirality now what we can also see is that this phenomenon extends to to the to the remote bands and um, what you can have here is um, so i plotted the the chirality for the second and third band and you can see that only the the addition is actually leading to a plateau and in the end to a vanishing chirality over a very large um, region of um, um, doping levels and um, you can go further and, and plot now um, the plateaus for commensurate um, states and you can see that there's some kind of quantization so you can always see that there's a plateau um, um, at a, a further um, quantum and it even goes beyond the, the the magic angle so when you go beyond the magic angle at least for the first plateau it also approximately holds this quantization so this kind of hints to a um, certain protection and that there's a new definition for this magic angle, which might be interesting to, to, to uncover um, further in order to understand better this, this, this nature. Now, let me come to, um, at, the, at the end of my talk to some application. And um, I told you that there, there, there's a correlation between currents in one direction and in the other direction, in the transverse direction. And this means that um, when you have a current fluctuation here in both layers, this means a, a fluctuating electric dipole, which gives rise to plasmons. You will also have current fluctuations, which are perpendicular, but different in orientation of the two layers. And this means that there's a loop current here which is created by this original current. And this loop current gives rise to a magnetic moment. And this magnetic moment is linked to the electric moment. And this is the definition of a chiral transition. And the proportionality is given by this factor chi. And chi is um, plotted here. So it's the, the dx divided by the total Drude rate. And as you can see, it is non-zero. And also it changes sign at this um, magic angle. And the same quantity here is also responsible that the energy flux is actually deflected. Um, so um, you propagate in one direction and um, with, with Q, but you will then form actually an angle between the propagation direction and the energy flux. Now, um, this is, um, Plasmons is, is actually squeezed light as, as, as you might know. And um, so we were able to, um, squeeze light now from the far field into the near field by a factor of th 300. This is the typical number in, 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 in graphene samples. And we can now calculate the chirality of this resulting near field. And um, as I told you from in the very beginning, if you squeeze light, you kind of match the, the scales and you should actually increase now this chirality or this, this, this factor. And if you compare to the the near field to the far field, you see that for unscreened um, plasmons, um, it is largely, largely enhanced, but it can even, if you put now a metallic gate close to it, it can even, even go up to, to 100 or even up to 1000 or 2000. And this is a nice prospect. So we, we kind of envision now the possibility of creating a new um, platform to, to, to induce new chemistry that can maybe um, induce new reactions um, and, and new um, um, chiral molecules which, which are actually not formed in, in natural conditions. So this is um, kind of the idea that, um, that we, we propose. And, right, and right this is... Um, sorry, oh, you, you finished. Yeah, okay. this is my, this is the end, sorry. Um, this is the end, so um, I, will, I will close now. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Uh, time for one quick question. Uh, from Bruno Amorim, um, who's asking, in general, commensurate structures are classified by two integers, M and R. Are your results just for the R equals one case? 
or do you get dxy quantization also for r not equals one cases? Um, I guess that Bruno is referring to this quantization. I'm now not sure if this is what he means. Um, I have only considered this, um, this um, case here. So I have not further investigated it for general i and, and j, so for, for the more, more general um, commensurate twist angles. Okay, thanks. There, there is another question in the chat, but unfortunately we have to move on. So maybe you can, you can answer that in the chat. All right. Uh, but, but thanks very much, uh, Tobias. And uh, next up is Yves Kwan. All right, so, uh, I'll share Yves. my screen. Yeah. Um, Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, it's working, thanks. Okay, and I can start, I guess. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, so yeah, thank you for this opportunity to give a talk here. Um, so today I want to give an overview of some of our recent work um, where we studied the, uh, the collective modes or the excitons of the quantum anomalous Hall state in uh, HBN aligned TVG. And uh, I won't go into too many of the technical details, you can find them in these two archive preprints. I just sort of aim to give a general flavor of the main ideas behind our work. So I just have um, this one slide to sort of go through the setup of the problem. So as we know, um, if you take magic angle TVG and you align it with the HPN substrate, what the HPN does is that it breaks the C2 symmetry and therefore it gaps the direct points that would have connected the valence and the conduction bands. So this is a schematic of the resulting band structure. We have these eight bands, eight central bands. Um, they're roughly flat. And uh, we have eight because there's a factor of two because of spin. Um, there's an SU2 spin symmetry here actually. And there's also another factor of two because of the two values, K and K prime. And there's a time reversal symmetry that links these two. Um, I've also color coded these bands. Um, the point is that HBN can also open a topological gap and so I've color coded it blue if it's a churn number one band and red if it's a churn number minus one band. Um, I'm going to work at a fixed electron filling. Um, I'm actually going to focus on the commensurate filling of plus three. So this means I have enough electrons to fill seven of the eight bands. And because these bands are pretty flat, um, if you consider the interactions, you can expect the interactions to potentially induce some sort of symmetry breaking. And here, for example, the, the Hunts coupling can give rise to time reversal breaking and flavor polarization. Um, so here, for example, I have a spin and valley polarized state. And if you get this sort of insulator, um, because these bands are topological, you'd expect some sort of anomalous Hall response. And indeed, in, in two experiments last year by the uh, Gold Haber Gordon group and Andrea Young's group, uh, they did indeed see an anomalous Hall effect and a quantized anomalous Hall effect at mu equals to plus three. Now, in this talk, I want to focus on the uh, neutral excitations of the parent quantum anomalous Hall states. So, for example, I can, you know, kick an electron from this band and put it in this band, leaving behind this hole, and the hole and the electron can attract through Coulomb interaction and form a bound state, i.e., an exciton. And as you can see, there are many different types of excitons that you can make. Um, and an obvious question is, you know, what are the spectra of these collective excitations? Um, they have, this has already been addressed to some degree by these references. But moreover, we're also interested now in the topology of these excitons, right? The idea is that, well, the underlying single particle bands are topological, so maybe the excitons inherit some topology from them. And this is addressed in this paper. And based on these results, we next speculate on the possibility for more exotic many body states of excitons. And this is in this paper, and but also see this other paper which has uh, related ideas. Um, so the thing is that the, the band structure of TBG is quite complicated, right? You have these eight bands, um, there's some dispersion, they're not exactly flat, and they have some very complicated form factors. So I'm going to make a series of approximations to try and take this to a simpler model that we can solve exactly. So first of all, um, there's a single particle gap that separates the valence and conduction bands. So I'm going to project to just the central conduction bands. So now we just have four bands. And um, with four bands, now the bands are uniquely identified by the valley and the spin. And now I'm going to exploit the topological equivalence between churn bands and Landau levels. 
But I need to remember that to pick the sign of the magnetic field to reflect the churn structure of the original bands. So for example, I can map a valley K band onto a lambda level with a positive field, but because of time reversal, I have to therefore map a valley K prime band onto a lambda level with negative field. I'm going to make one final simplification, which is that I'm just going to consider B equals to plus one. It's not very important, but it just makes the pictures a bit easier to draw. So at nu equals to plus one, I have enough electrons to fill one of four bands. And if I now consider interactions, what will happen is that we'll get some sort of quantum hole ferro mechanism. So basically, um, you'll get some valley and spin polarization. So here, for example, I've arbitrarily chosen the electrons to fill valley K and spin up. And this state will come with a charge gap. So you can already see that there are two types of excitons that I can make. There are the intravalley excitons. So these are excitons that do not change the valley population. So an example is this spin flip where I make a hole and I put the electron in the same valley just with a flip spin. But on the other hand, I can also consider a different type of exciton, which are the um, intervalley excitons, where the valley population does change. So this is an example where I put the electron instead in valley K prime. And so this valley flip exciton is an example of an intervalley exciton. And as you can see, the, the target bands of these two excitons are very different, right? They have different churn numbers. So you can expect them to have qualitatively different properties. And we can already gain some intuition for this just by thinking about the classical mechanics of the hole and the electron. So here, um, this is just, this slide is just Newton's laws, basically. Um, so in this first row, I'm considering the intravalley exciton, where the electron and the hole come from the same valley, so they have the same field. And um, if you work through the equations, you'll notice that the, the center of mass of this whole exciton actually experiences zero net coupling to the magnetic field. And this means that you can actually consider in excitons which basically have a conserved momentum and they basically can propagate in some direction, for example. Now, the intervalley exciton is very different uh, because now the electron belongs to a different valley, so it has an opposite field. And if you work through the same equations, you'll find out that the center of mass experiences a net field. And indeed, it couples to the external field with twice the strength as the original electrons. And basically, this means that the center of mass is no longer free. It's now quantized by, it's also, it's also now lambda quantized as well by the external coupling to the field. And this is reflected in the exact spectrum of the excitons. So here, we've calculated exactly the exciton spectra in the interacting lambda level model. So first of all, we have this blue curve, which is the intravalley exciton, i.e. just a spin wave. As you can see, it's gapless, it's dispersing, and it has a quadratic dispersion. So the fact that it's gapless is just the fact that this is the goldstone mode for the broken SE2 symmetry, so that's good. Um, on the other hand, the intervalley excitons are gapped. Um, that's okay, because there's no goldstone mode associated with the bro discrete broken time reversal symmetry. However, we find that these, these intervalley modes are actually topological and exactly flat. And that can be traced back to this picture where we saw that the center of mass motion is actually quantized by the external field. Um, furthermore, um, the degeneracy of each of these intervalley branches is actually two times the number of flex quanta. And the factor of two, again, comes from the doubled coupling to the external field. Um, and we've also checked that we can perturb the lambda level model slightly. We can, for example, add a periodic potential or um, perturb the wave function slightly to induce a single particle barrier curvature perturbation. And this can uh, introduce some um, dispersion to the intervalley excitons, but they are stable, the topology is stable for finite perturbations. So, okay, so this is the results for this simple lambda level model. So now let's go back to Moray systems. Let's go back to HB and TBG. So we have to bring back all the bands now. Um, and what we did is that we used the uh, bistritzer mcdonald continuum model and we numerically solved for the two types of excitons. So these are these two panels. So first of all, we have the spin flip exciton. Um, as you can see, it's gapless and it's quadratic as well. And we have the valley flip exciton. So this is an intervalley exciton and it's gapped and the lowest branch is pretty flat. There's only like a, a milli-electron volt in width. And so at, at least from the perspective of 
the energy spectra, they seem to conform to our intuition based on this simplified model. But we also saw that in this model, we, we saw that the intervallic exotones were actually topological. Right? Each of these branches had a turn number of one or minus one. Now, it turns out that the things are more complicated for crystalline systems, and you can see the details in this paper. So the, the, the more of the story is that for certain parameter regimes, unfortunately, the intervallic exoton is trivial. However, if you change the parameters, for example, here we're perturbing, we're changing the value of the substrate strength, for certain regimes where indeed the lowest intervallic exoton branches are topological. So for example, here I've plotted the exotonic barrier curvature and it's non-zero and it integrates to minus one. And so to summarize this part of the talk, um, basically we found that for the intervalley exotons in HB and TBG, for certain regimes, we can actually find topological intervalley exoton bands. And if you have these, then this will give rise to um, chiral exoton edge modes. And these edge modes can transport valley charge, but they're actually charge neutral because of course these exotons being a whole in electrons are actually charge neutral. Um, but even in cases where the lowest exciton bands so, hap so happen to be trivial, we still find that they have substantial barrier curvature, uh, exciton barrier curvature. So for example, here we see that there are barrier curvature hotspots at the gamma points of the mori zone, And in this case, this can drive anomalous bulk exciton transport. I also want to point out that because TVG has a pretty good um, U1 valley conservation, that these intervalley excitons are expected to be quite long lived. And so uh, aggregating these observations together, um, I come to the following statement, which is that, you know, it looks like we have approximately conserved bosons in a flat topological band. And that's quite striking because, you know, now you can wonder what happens if we have a finite density of such bosons, right? Can we, for example, stabilize some more exotic state, such as uh, a fractured quantum Hall state of such bosons? So to answer this question, I'm going to uh, resort back to the lambda level model. And one question I need to answer is, you know, what are the inter exciton attract, uh, uh, interactions, right? Because in order to have any hope of stabilizing such uh, fractured quantum Hall states, I need to ensure that the objects, the bosons, repel. So it's not entirely obvious how to achieve this, but in the lambda level model, what we can do is we can imagine that the two valleys actually live on slightly different planes. So for example, I can imagine that this blue band, i.e. Uh, this is uh, K prime, it, it's separated by the other valley by distance D. And so what this does is that this actually introduces uh, some asymmetry in the interactions. So for example, the interaction between electrons in different valleys is suppressed relative to the interaction between electrons in the same valley. And um, you can show that if you increase D enough, you can engineer a system where these excitons, these tightly bound intervalley excitons, actually repel. And so if this is possible, then we basically have all the ingredients we need for this bosonic fracture corner hole hierarchy. We have repulsive, conserved, topological flat band bosons. And to, to sort of set up this hierarchy, let me again start from the parent quantum anomalous Hall state. So this is the state where we filled up one of the valleys, valley K, but have an empty valley K prime band. I'm gonna ignore spin for this. Um, and okay, so the total electronic filling is one. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to keep the same total electronic filling, but I'm going to change the valley populations. So I'm going to introduce a density delta of electrons in K prime and a density delta of holes in, um, uh, in valley K. And so what will happen is that these objects will form uh, tightly bound intervalley excitons and the effective bosonic filling will be delta over two. And, and this factor of two uh, comes back to this factor of two in the degeneracy of the lambda levels for the excitons. And so basically now if for example, if delta is, you know, um, if delta is one over an integer, then this will be one over an even integer, which means that we can construct exotonic Laughlin states. And the key point I want to make is that for this, for the same total electronic density, we can actually get different exotonic states just by changing this fraction delta. 
And um, we've done some preliminary numerical studies in our paper, which suggests that um, indeed some of these exotonic lofensis can be stabilized for certain values of delta and parameters. Um, and I also want to make some statements about the properties of these states. So uh, one thing about these exotonic Laughlin states is that um, they actually have the same quantum hole response as the fully polarized quantum monolens hole state. That's basically just because these excitons are charge neutral. Um, however, they have different valley quantum hole responses because um, these objects, these intervalley excitons carry valley charge. Um, also, if you were to look at the edge structure, um, you will get the original uh, uh, integer edge of the parent quantum monomus all edge, but this state will now give you a counter propagating neutral edge mode, which can carry heat and value. And in our paper, we'll also look at other types of competing states that might be present depending on the interactions, etc. So um, it looks like I'm running to the end of my time. So I think I'll just end by flashing you the slide. So thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Eve. Um, yeah, floor is open for, for questions. So, so feel free to, to type any questions you have. Um, in the meantime, I, I, I can get started with, with one question. And, and that's about, uh, it's probably more about terminology than, than anything else. So you're right, so right. talking about the word excitons and, and uh, basically, I mean, in, initially that made sense to me because you're saying the the HPN creates a gap in, in the twisted bilayer graphene. Mm -hmm. But then you're also assuming that it's actually highly doped. So you're actually looking at excitons in a metal. And typically people don't do that because in a metal, the Coulomb interaction is screened. So you actually don't get excitons. So can you, can you clarify this? Sure. A little? So maybe I'll, I'll try and clarify. I'll, maybe I'll go back to, uh, uh, actually, let me go back to the first slides. Um, so I guess, um, so let's say we're at this sort of filling. Right. Um, so what will happen is that if you look at the, say, the hartree fock band structure, um, you'll, the interactions will induce a gap to this. So this state will be lifted up by the interactions and these field states will be lifted down. So I guess our intuition for the word exton is that um, we, we can, we can it's, there's now the band gap to the unfilled band. So the exciton is therefore just, I can just dope a single electron on top of this filling. And that will that is what we define as the ex, a single exciton, for example. So does that answer your question? I see. Okay. So this yeah. picture is slightly misleading. You're saying that there's actually a gap between K and K prime. That's right. So here I, I've just shown the non-interacting band structure, but with interactions, there will be um, into the Hartree and whatever potentials will actually change the levels and you'll end up with a gap. So, yeah. is, uh, is that actually what you do? I mean, you haven't shown much about your, you know, your methods, but when you show these exciton dispersions, how, how do you actually calculate them? Uh -huh. so, so actually the version on the archive uh, is a bit older. So in the, in the archive version, we actually just projected to the conduction bands. But for these plots, these are slightly newer. We're going to update the archive version. So here we actually started, we actually started with the hartree fock ground state at nucleus of three. So this is fully reconstructed. And then based on that, we do an RPA approximation to calculate the single exciton uh, 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 energy levels. I see. So you do, is, is another way of saying this that you actually do a, a beta side beta calculation. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's another way of saying it. Exactly. A beta side beta equation. That's right. On top of a hard free fog ground state. That's right. That's right. I see. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much for these explanations. And any other questions at this point? Um, doesn't look like it. So in, in that case, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, next speaker is uh, Luke uh, Rademacher. Uh, so, so Luke, you can al already start uh, sharing your screen and then we'll, we'll wait uh, a minute or so until it's, it's, it's time. All right, cool. You see it already? Yeah, it's there. Perfect. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, all right. So yeah. Give it a minute.
All right, well, why don't we get started then? You have a little bit of extra time. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, thanks the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about my work here. And I decided to extend it a bit because there's an overarching theme of the things I've been working on related to twisted bilayer graphene and other twisted structures, which is combination of correlations and topology. Uh, luckily, uh, the last talk already introduced the quantum normal Hall effect, so I don't need to uh, introduce that. I will discuss two topics. First, something we call Hofstad or subband magnetism, which is a phenomenon which is, includes correlations and churn bands, but then in the presence of a magnetic field. And the second topic will be about uh, a new type of material, which I think hasn't been discussed yet, which is twisted monolayer bilayer graphene, which naturally is a platform for topology and correlations. So to start with, we know we all have flat bands. I won't go into detail there, uh, but you know that if you take any band structure, of a lattice system and you apply a magnetic field, you get a fractal spectrum, which is known as a Hofstadter butterfly. Now, here you see on the right of the slide, you see the Hofstadter butterfly for twisted bilayer graphene that we calculated. And you see this beautiful fractal structure and at each given flux, which is this axis, you have multiple bands. Each of these bands carries a non-zero churn number. Now the reason this happens is similar to the lambda level physics also discussed in the last talk. Lambda levels naturally carry uh, edge states, which means they carry a churn number because the churn number is nothing else than the quantized transverse conductance. Another way to view the churn number is uh, through the so-called strata formula, which says that the churn number is equal to the derivative of the number of states in a band uh, with respect to the change in magnetic field. So here I express it explicitly in in terms, of, uh, in terms of the flux per Marais unit cell. This means that if you have a band with a positive churn number, increasing the field creates more states in that band. So uh, to, to visualize this in this butterfly, there is here in the middle, all these bands together can be viewed as one big churn number two band, which is also something you know in regular graphene-based systems. Anytime you have two Dirac cones, put a magnetic field, you have a so-called zero lambda level, which carries a churn number two. But now because the whole flat bands, they are uh, turn neutral, they carry turn number zero, you have this effect that the flat bands are split into three sub bands. The middle one is a turn number two, which is a direct consequence of having direct cones. And the other two are turn numbers minus one. And the interesting thing now is because you have uh, started out with flat bands, you know that in flat bands correlations are uh, play an important role. The moment you make them even flatter by introducing the magnetic field, you are more like, even more likely to, to get interactions. So what we did is we, uh, we did a hartree fock calculation to start with. And uh, the basic thing that you will get is spin and valley polarization. Because this previous butterfly I showed you contains, uh, is fourfold degenerate. So you have spin and valley degeneracy. And as you know, there's this, the simple way that you can understand spontaneous polarization is via the stoner mechanism. Stoner mechanism tells you if there's an effective interaction times the density of states is larger than one, then you, your system wants to spontaneously polarize, in this case, either in spin or valley degrees of freedom. And because these C equal minus one bands become narrower as you increase the magnetic field, the density of states goes up, so it's more and more likely that you spontaneously polarize. And the effect that then happens is, is summarized here. You have here, for example, the flux at one seventh of flux quanta per more unit cell. You see this density of states splits into these three bands I've been mentioning. And then if I look at the occupation of each spin and valley degree of freedom, so there's four of them, you, in the beginning they, they start to occupy equally, but at some point you reach this high density of states, you start to get polarization and one of the states will completely occupy, or one of the spin valleys will completely occupy the lower band, and the other will reset to be completely empty. Uh, and this process repeats, so you get actually, if you would look at changing the density as a function, or well, changing the density at a fixed magnetic field, you get a sequence of different correlated turn insulators with, in this case, a sequence will be minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, and then again, minus two and zero. Note that this is a similar phenomena that's been observed already in the absence of a magnetic field where they call it a, a cascade of transitions where you reset the, the charge density for each spin valley to the Dirac cone. Uh, but we expect this also to happen in a finite magnetic field. 
And this is exactly what has been seen by my collaborators in Santa Barbara who did the experiments. They did this magneto transport. This is a picture on the left of the uh, longitudinal resistance. So bear in mind that uh, dark means low longitudinal resistance, but because these are turn insulators, a low longitudinal resistance still means that it's an insulator. So uh, these dark lines have a slope and following the straight-up formula I mentioned, this slope indicates that these states carry a turn number, which can be extracted from the raw data here into a kind of cartoon version where you say, okay, I have these slopes. And indeed you see minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. Well, there's also a minus three in, in here, which means there's even further uh, symmetry breaking beyond the simple picture I just showed you. But the, uh, the basic new physics that's shown here is that indeed in a, in a finite magnetic field, you can get uh, spontaneous spin and valley polarization to give you correlated turn insulator states. So this is uh, also the same as here, but then on a cut at a fixed field. So at a field of 10 Tesla, you see a state where you have one spin valley occupying this lower band, the C equal minus Hofstadter band. Uh, and then there's a next state where two spin valley degrees of freedom occupy this lower state. So it's, it's a beautiful physics. It's very easy to understand. So uh, yeah, it's, it's something I very much like. The interesting thing is these data are taken at four Kelvin, uh, which is pretty high still. So if you even cool the system further, you get a much richer uh, system. Here you can see, in addition to this minus one, minus two, minus three, et cetera, turn bands, uh, turn insulator states, you see a whole zoo of extra states. So this is the raw data again, and there's trying to extract the main lines you can see from this magneto transport plot. The uh, interesting thing is in this regime, you can zoom in a bit, there's extra states appearing that cannot be explained by simple spin valley polarization. This is because uh, if you just have spin valley polarization, these lines would extrapolate to integer fillings at zero field. But in this case, you have lines, these here in red, they extrapolate to half integer filling at a zero magnetic field. And that means that on top of spin and valley polarization, there must be extra forms of symmetry breaking. And most likely this is a form of translational symmetry breaking or maybe uh, pneumatic symmetry breaking. The reason why we think this happens is that by analyzing where you states are, if by looking at the Hofstadter butterfly, we see that these, uh, well, extra symmetry broken turn insulators happen in bands, turn bands that have uh, a net turn number two. Now it's known from the zeroth lambda level in graphene that the zeroth lambda level can have a lot of interesting uh, symmetry breaking happening. So we're trying to understand what's happening here in analogy to the zeroth lambda level in graphene. Uh, so that was the, the part about the magneto, uh, magneto transport in twisted bilayer graphene and the correlated states you get there. In order to get correlations and topology in the absence of a magnetic field, you need to do some tuning with your regular twisted structures. Now we saw in the previous talk that uh, if you put twisted bilayer graphene on HBN, it opens up the gap in one of the layers, you get uh, turn bands. Now you can even do something better because this HBN alignment, it's, it's very hard to tune that. You can uh, instead add a third layer that breaks the sublattice symmetry explicitly by just introducing uh, by just stacking monolayer graphene with AB stacked bilayer graphene. Because you can also view that as you take twisted bilayer graphene and you add another graphene layer on top, which breaks the subflat symmetry in the top layer. So we expect that if you make this structure, you automatically get uh, a topological band structure and then interactions can create things like turn insulators and then quantum anomalous Hall effect. So in detail, I can, I can tell you how we did this. The, the thing is you can just make a continuum model just like for regular twisted bilayer graphene. Um, you now have three layers. So the first two layers are exactly the same model as twisted bilayer graphene, uh, which I guess many of you have seen over this uh, today and yesterday. Um, and the other two layers, or the, the second and the third layer together, they form this regular AB stack bilayer graphene, which means the A sublattice of one layer is on top of the B sublattice of the other layer. So per valley, this gives you bands with net churn numbers, so as, we, as we were hoping. But it's even a slightly bit more interesting than the, the case with DBG on HBN, because uh, the net churn number of the two flat bands is non-zero, whereas in DBG on HBN, you would have 
the two flat bands with opposite turn number in a single value. Now, the reason this happens is, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a cone missing for some reason. Um, the, the reason you can understand these turn numbers occurring is thinking about you have these two direct cones in a single valley. They come from the two different layers. But because of the twist angle is very small, these two cones that are very close to each other, they carry the same chirality. Yeah? Direct cones always carry a chirality. And the moment you open up the gaps between with cones that have the same chirality, that gives you uh, turn bands. Now, on top of that, the extra layer that we added already carried in a chirality in itself because it's, we added another direct cone to it. So there's actually a general uh, phenomena that if you have M plus N layers of twisted graphene, so M layers of graphene on top of N layers of graphene and there's a twist between them, there uh, is a net churn number per valley uh, for the associated flat bands that you get. And the net, net churn number is just M minus N. So in the case that we study here, it's uh, two layers plus one layer, so the net churn number per valley is one or minus one, depending on the family. And that's what we see here. Depending on the perpendicular electric field, which is a, a tuning knob that you have in the experiments, you either have uh, a sequence of like minus two plus one per valley, or zero and minus one, or one and minus two. So there's, there's a large degree of tunability you can get through various topological transitions in twisted monolayer bilayer graphene. But notice that uh, in particular, we find that the uh, bands are the flattest and are really well, nicely separated in energy if you go to a positive electric field. Uh, so that's where we want to find um, uh, correlated states. Now, in addition, I should mention that for twisted bilayer graphene, you have this phenomenon called the magic angle. But in this case, that's not something that, that is relevant because the magic angle tells you something about the renormalization of the Dirac velocity. Here, there's no protected Dirac cones, they're gapped. So there's no sense in talking about a renormalized Dirac velocity. So rather than a magic angle, there's just a window where the band structure is 10 MeV or, or the bandwidth is 10 MeV or less. So that's a region where, where you should look, be looking at. And that's between like one and one and a half degrees. So there's, there's some room for, uh, for playing there. Uh, like before, one of the things we look at when you have uh, topological band structures, it's interesting to look at how it looks like when you apply a magnetic field. Because following the Strata formula, if you have a negative turn number, applying a magnetic field reduces the number of states in those bands. And this is exactly what you see. Uh, this is the uh, Hofstadter butterfly to the right for a uh, positive field, to the left for a negative field, or the other way around if you switch the, val switch the valleys. And you see that uh, if you have a C equal minus state, the number of states is clearly reduced. When you have a C equals plus one, the number of states clearly increases if you increase the field. So this asymmetry is a way that you can actually detect the topological band structure by just applying a magnetic field and looking at uh, magnetotransport. What you would see in an experiment is usually you tune the density, you tune the flux. So we have to convert this Hofstadter butterfly into something which is called a Wanye plot, which is a plot of the density of states, or in case of the, if you do the experiments, it would be the transverse, or sorry, the longitudinal resistance, but they're related. Okay. Uh, I guess someone needs to mute. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this is this one year plot is the same uh, same information as this Hofstadter butterfly, but this is how you would see it in experiments, highly asymmetric. Uh, part of the part of the uh, system has a low density of states where you can clearly see these Lando levels. Here you have a much higher density of states and much more mixing of them. This asymmetry is a signature of uh, the topological nature of these bands. Now, um, of course, I'm very much, I'm always interested in correlated physics. That's, that's the thing that, uh, that, I like, that I like the most. Because you have flat bands, you expect that the interactions become relevant. Now, Coulomb interactions uh, are the thing that you expect to happen in these, in these uh, two-dimensional systems. So what we did is we took these Coulomb interactions and we project them onto uh, the flat bands and do a hartree fock calculation of the states we expect. And as before, uh, because of basically the dominant term is direct exchange, again, spin valley polarization, just like in twisted bilayer graphene, is the thing that's most likely to happen if interactions are dominating. So here we calculated the relative energy between the symmetric state and the symmetry broken state at various fillings, like one, two, and three. 
which means we take this upper flat band um, either at negative electric field or at positive electric field. At positive electric field, these correlated states are much more stable, uh, and notably at nu equals one and nu equals three, so one or three electrons per Moray unit cell relative to charge neutrality. We find that uh, a turn insulator state is the most stable. And this turn insulator state carries the turn number two, because that was just happened to be the turn number at that band in the band structure I showed you earlier. If you have spontaneous spin, or spin and valley polarization giving you a net turn number and the state is insulating, that's exactly the recipe to get the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Remember, that's the interesting phenomena that even in the absence of a magnetic field, you have transverse conductance that's quantized. And unlike twisted bilayer graphene, now the, the, the quantization number should be two. And amazingly, uh, there were several groups in April who studied or did the experiments on twisted monolayer bilayer graphene. And uh, this group, I think the Santa Barbara group, they saw indeed at nu equal one and nu equal three a quantum anomalous Hall effect. Well, the quantization is not perfect, but as you can see, it, it's almost here at a half. Uh, so that's the resistance, which means it has a turn number two consistent with what we predicted from our Hartree Fock calculations. Um, but just like twisted bilayer graphene, the fact that you just have flat bands and dominant correlations means you can have, like before, a whole zoo of different phases. So there's another group who saw this sequence of uh, correlated insulator states, and there's another group here that saw signatures of superconductivity. So all in all, uh, twisted monolayer bilayer graphene is just yet another sandwich platform that you can use to study different types of phases in physics. Uh, but mainly focused on topology in this case. So with that, I come to the end of my talk. Um, there's the, the two works I discussed around the archive. And I'd like to thank my collaborators in Geneva, Dima and Ivan for the theory and uh, the, exper the experimentalists that I work with in Santa Barbara, you and Andrea. And thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, for, thanks very much, Luke. Uh, that, was, that was pretty cool stuff. Um, there, there's already two questions out there. I mean, one question was uh, from Unmesh Gorai, who, who basically wanted to know, again, the structure of uh, the twisted uh, mono bilayer graphene. Is it an AB bilayer with a twisted monolayer on top? Yeah. <laughs> I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a quick one. But there is another question from Yves Kwan. He's asking for uh, the twisted uh, mono bilayer graphene. Is there any particular layer localization for the churn band? E.g., is one of the bands, uh, say, localized more in the bilayer rather than the monolayer? Uh, yes, and I forgot by head which one it was. I think one of the experimental papers uh, that I uh, mentioned make, make an explicit point of that that depending on the electric field, you can tune in which layer uh, the, the dominant physics happens. So I, I don't remember by how, which layers it was, but it's something that you can tune by the electric field. I hope that's helping. Uh, I hope that's a sufficient uh, answer. Yeah, so he's, he uh, seems to be uh, the right answer. <laughs> um, we have one more minute, so, so maybe I can also ask a question. And, uh, um, it, was, it was also related to the sort of uh, three, uh, uh, three different layers being not quite equivalent, right? So when, when you just look at uh, um, charge distribution from your band structure calculation, you probably, the charge won't be equally uh, distributed among the layers, right? And yes. that, that, that can give rise to electric fields. Uh, are, are those included in your calculations? Uh, you mean in a self-consistent way? No. Right. So, I mean, if you think of Hartree theory, right, then this, this distribution of charge will give rise to like, you know, these are like parallel plate capacitors. Yeah, and center point. So no, we did not take that into account. What we did is, um, I mean, you have, to, you have to take into account that the Moray unit cell is very large. So even just one Moray unit cell is still basically a very thin pancake, right? So what we did is we projected everything into a two-dimensional plane and took it from there. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe you can get interesting physics in there, uh, especially since the perpendicular electric field is an important tuning factor. So yeah, um, right. probably a more, more accurate calculation would be to take into account like the full three-dimensional nature of the, of the sandwich. You're right.
Okay. All right. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, okay. And I think we, we can move on to, uh, to the next speaker, which is Peter Mack. So Peter, if you, if you can start to share your screen and, and thank, thank you, Luke. <laughs> All right. So that works fine. And uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. I, I, do you have to unmute, unmute yourself? We can't hear you yet. Oh, okay. Um, we can't hear you yet, sorry. I think there's a problem with the uh, with the sound. Yes, yeah. uh, Peter, please check that uh, in uh, close to the microphone there is a uh, like um, an arrow, and there there are the options for the microphone. Maybe you didn't select the one that you have to select. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, it was working in the morning, but thanks a lot for... <laughs> okay. So thanks again for giving us the opportunity to present this work. Um, um, so this is our motivation. So, I mean, I will talk about graphene, HB and heterostructures. And I guess for now you have pretty good idea why people like graphene. So, I mean, the Dirac spectrum, it's also easy to work with, I have to mention. So, you know, you can combine with superconducting ferromagnetic electrodes, you can suspend it, you can form gapless PN interfaces. So these were some of the things which we liked. Now, the other uh, large opportunity is that you can combine with other materials and you can engineer the band structure. You know, you can um, have spin orbit interaction in graphene exchange, superconducting proximity. And as you see, like the super lattice effects, which we will talk about also in this, uh, so in, in the recent years, we have been working on different aspects of, of the graphene and HPN super lattice. Today, oh, what I will concentrate on is the super current. You're not sharing your screen. All right, it's working. Go ahead. So thanks a lot. So I mean, uh, uh, as I was saying in the previous uh, slide, what our main um, idea was that if we can combine graphene with other materials, you can engineer the band structure of graphene. And now, um, you know, in, in the recent years, we, we have been working on several aspects of this, like the HPN graphene super lattice. And what I will concentrate on today is the supercurrent in, in graphene super lattice. And also, I will touch upon the long wavelengths more if time permits. Okay, so here is our image on, on two lattices on top of each other. You have seen many of these ones. Now imagine one is graphene, the other is HPN. Um, and as also you may know, the, the super lattice period depends on the angle of rotation. The longer super lattice you can get when they are fully aligned to each other. Um, what we do is that we fabricate, let's say, with the standard old school method. So we look at in optical microscopes, the crystal edges, and usually you have quite nice edges cleaving along zigzag or armchair edges. And by just putting um, you know, straight edges on straight edges, you can get more structures quite simply. Um, so all the measurements which I showed were fabricated like this in this uh, talk. So these are some early measurements. So from the, the pristine graphene heterostructure, when you form a more heterostructure, you will get a bit more complex uh, band structure at low energy. So this is a calculation from John Wallbank. And what you have to see is that uh, there are several bands appearing at uh, moderate energies, moderately uh, at, at positive or, or negative energies. Um, I, I think what, what, is, what is clear that that uh, valence band, the, the appearance of, of secondary Dirac points is, is more clear in the, uh, most of the experiments. Here also the band structure calculations, as far as I understand, are less sensitive to the the parameters of the band structure, whereas in the conduction band, it's usually a bit more complicated. You have more bands. 
What I would like to highlight that there are these secondary Dirac points appearing and there are also saddle points or on-off singularities. And this is one of the first measurements which I have chosen where you see you know, peaks in the uh, longitudinal conductance and um, like changes in the whole conductance at the secondary Dirac point. So now what we will do is that we will combine this with uh, supercurrent measurements. So what we will do is we will put superconducting electrodes in graphene and we will measure supercurrent between the electrodes. So this means that you will have transport of Cooper pairs between the super con two superconducting electrodes. This is also called Josephson current or DC Josephson effect. And here the idea is that you can have a dissipationless current, which is proportional to the so-called critical current. And it also depends between the, on the phase difference between the superconducting uh, electrodes. So here you can describe them with macroscopic phases and the difference will give you how much current you have. So this is called current phase relation. You can mostly or, or simply imagine that this is a sine function of the phase difference. I think generally it's a good approximation. Now, um, um, what you have to do in experiment, usually you don't phase bias, but you current bias. So what you do is that you change the current and the phase will adjust. And at some point you will see that the current which you apply is larger than this critical current and the junction will not be able to carry more or less, more dissipationless current and you will have a finite resistance. And this is what is shown in such a map here. What we show is one axis is the source strain current, the other is the gate voltage. And finally, what you can see with the color is the differential resistance. And these, these black or, or dark regions correspond to the, the zero resistance state. Whereas the dashed line shows a cut where you really see that in the middle, you have um, zero resistance, whereas outside you have a finite uh, resistance. So now uh, what we have done is that we combine this kind of measurements with a super lattice. So we have used molybdenum radium electrodes, um, which have a large gap. Um, they can survive large magnetic fields and you can still have a reasonable coherence length in the free. So here is such a measurement similar to the one I showed in the previous slide. So now again, current bias, back gate voltage and the differential resistance. And what you see here is that at some larger gate voltages, um, so this is the main Dirac point, the critical current starts to decrease. And now you can just look together the critical current shown with blue. So this is like this, the, the envelope function of this one. And you can um, look also the differential resistance, the two terminal resistance normal state resistance. And what you see is that the critical current decreases when the normal state resistance increases. So for example, at the secondary Dirac point. And um, before we go on the analysis, just some, some numbers. So our super lattice had a period around 11 nanometer. We had a mean free pass around 100, 200 nanometers. So the junction were more or less in the 500 to one micron range. So what we had is like long junctions in the diffusive regime from superconducting point of view. And, and it is known for such junction that if you take the, the product of the normal state resistance and the critical current, RNIC, then this will be proportional to the tireless energy, which can be written like H bar D over L square. Now, why this is interesting for us? Because the diffusion constant is connected by the Einstein relation to the density of states. So now if you are able to measure the normal state resistance and the critical current at the same time, then with this equation, you can get uh, um, density of states just from normal state measurement and um, critical current measurements. And this is such um, um, a measurement. So here you see, first of all, with the black dash line, a theory curve, what you expect for the DOS. This, this is from um, John Wallbank, a calculation from Manchester. And the rest of them is, um, is measurement and extraction on different junctions with different lengths. And, uh, First of all, I would say that more or less they follow the theoretical expression here are in the gray regions. We don't really have sensitivity uh, due to the low supercurrent. But what you see here is that also the, you know, the electron regime is usually quite complicated. So that's why we, can't, we focused on the, the whole regime. And the green curve, which corresponds to junction E, this shows really well the fun of singularity, the, um, the density of states increase, the blue and the red moderately. And, and for junction D, it, it's really upset, uh, absent. So we were a bit puzzled how this can happen, why, why our analysis doesn't work. And to understand this, what we have done is that we started to do magnetic field measurements. So now we apply a small perpendicular magnetic field. And again, at the fixed gate voltage, we start to record the critical current. 
and the black curve is, is always when you are in the superconducting state and, and you seem to uh, have switching currents um, which are modulated by, by the magnetic field. And it is well known that if you have a homogeneous current distribution, then you expect the pattern which is so-called Fraunhofer, which, which reminds you of the Fraunhofer single slit experiment. Whereas if you have edge currents dominated, then you will expect a cosine-like um, interference pattern. So um, just by measuring this interference pattern, you can get information on the current distribution uh, in some sense simply by inverse Fourier transform. Um, so this is what we have done. Now what is shown in this map is the density. The other axis is the magnetic field. Um, and with the color plot, you see the, the switching or critical current. This is what is shown here. It's a bit complex map, so I would just rather show uh, um, examples. So what we have done is that taking this map, which are shown here, you know, um, the critical current as a function of magnetic field, we have done the, the inverse Fourier transform and, and what is shown now and you should look at now is, is the current distribution within the sample. So with the color, it's shown how, how large is the supercurrent density at a well-defined position. And what you see is that I show two cuts. So this is like the, the junction uh, where you see more, more current. And I show two cuts, one at the fun of singularity and one at moderate densities. What you see at moderate densities, you have a bit of contribution from the edge current. However, at the fun of singularity, you have more, much more edge current, at least for junction D. So this already tells you that this might be related to the extraction of the density of states. And I would say that for junction C, where we have seen quite well the, the fun of singularity, we, we see rather um, moderate uh, presence of edge current. So here, the, the, the supercurrent is more homogeneous, the distribution of it. Um, so before I comment on why this edge current must be there, we have used this, this analysis. Now we know what is the bulk um, current, bulk supercurrent. And using the bulk supercurrent, we have again did the analysis. This is now shown with the blue curve. And now indeed you recover the fun of singularity. So this method to extract the density of states relies on that you have a homogeneous current distribution, which was obviously not the case here. And we try to correct this by just taking the bulk uh, supercurrent. And it seems that when you uh, more concentrate on the edge current, this feels less the uh, effect of the supercurrent, uh, of the super lattice. Um, my take on this edge current is, is rather that it's not something topological. I, I think it's an experimental um, um, procedure that, for example, when you fabricate the junctions, you edge them and maybe you introduce edge doping. Um, I, I would like to believe that it's something topological, but, but I think nothing really uh, aligns or, or not, nothing really points in this direction. So this is something which, which I think we are not the only ones seeing, that, that sometimes there's more edge current in graphene, but this is something which you have to take care, for example, when, um, when you extract the density of states. Um, so for example, um, before, when I switch gears now, I didn't say how we extracted the super lattice period. Um, what we did when we extracted in the previous measurement, the super lattice period is that we just have taken the density where you see the super lattice. And from that you could, from simple geometric arguments, get the, the angle of rotation and the, the length of the, um, of the Moiré super lattice. And this surprisingly works well. So many of the people do this. I mean, I don't wanna go through all, all the equations, but if you know the rotation between the two lattices, it really works well to get the super lattice period in these experiments. And for example, something which is known that if you don't have strain, the largest super lattice period which you expect for such a system is 14 nanometer. But let's keep this in mind. And with this, let's look at the, the following experiment here. We have a single layer of graphene, which is encapsulated again between boron nitrides. Now we don't have superconductivity in the system, but now we took, what we took care is that we align both the, the bottom and the top layer um, of the HPN with respect to graphene. And here's the measure, two terminal conductance measurement on such a system shown. So again, in the conductance, you see some dips. Um, this is the main Dirac point. This is um, something which uh, is, is more reasonable. What I, why I'm saying it's more reasonable is that, that now in the, the top axis, I show the, the super lattice period, which is uh, attributed to, to the, the minimums, um, to, this, uh, to these conductance minimums. So this would correspond to a 30 nanometer super lattice. This, you know that probably the two lattices are well aligned. 
Now, there's also a minimum here we mark by C, which are symmetric in both positive and negative doping, and these are uh, at 17 nanometers, which are much larger than the maximum 40 nanometer, which is possible. Uh, to understand this, let's look at the magnetic field dependence, the fan plot of, of this uh, system. And what you see is that there are uh, obviously um, Landau levels fanning out from the main Dirac point. There are Landau levels fanning out from, from this A Dirac point. And there is also something fanning out from, from C. This is not so well visible. And even less visible, what I, I highlighted, that there are some things coming out, coming into our system, which we, we don't really see because we cannot uh, apply larger gate voltage in the system. But if you would follow these lines, they would somewhere be at a super lattice period of nine nanometer with an alignment of 1.2 nanometer. So now let's call this B. So we have two super lattices with, for which we understand the periodicity is B and A. And we have a third one for which uh, in principle, the length scale is longer than what you could imagine. So now, um, I guess you know what, what we are aiming at. So what, what we believe to happen in this system is that when you have two super lattices uh, from the bottom and the top HPN layer, these two super lattices again can form, a, let's call it a super super lattice or an interference of the two super lattices, um, which is a even smaller modulation. And what I want to show in this, this image is that depending on how the two super lattices are aligned with respect to the, or the two HBM crystals are aligned with respect to the graphene lattice, uh, we calculate what is the length of the Moiré super lattice, Moiré super super lattice. So this is based on the same simple geometric argument, which I, which everyone uses to calculate the super lattice effect. And what you see is that if you go to small rotation angles, then you have, um, length, super lattice length scales or periods, which are much larger than the 40 nanometer. You can have 40 nanometer super, 40 nanometer super lattice and so on. So this is something uh, um, interesting. And now what we can do is that we can put on the A and B super lattice in this figure, just by the rotation angle. We have two options because we don't know if they are rotated in the same way with respect to graphene or opposite. And one of them, when they rotated in the same way, gives you a 17.2 nanometer super lattice, which is, matches amazingly well to the 17.1 um, or three uh, nanometer, which we extracted. So what we believe that the, with this one, that uh, what, you, what we see in this experiment is, is really the, the super lattice of, of the two super lattices. Um, so see, we were the first one reporting this a year ago, uh, but since then there were um, more and I think uh, more detailed studies appearing in the literature. So I, I would refer to these papers if you are more interested in the topic. And finally, I would just uh, highlight uh, one endeavor which we have now started in Budapest. Um, so our goal is now to um, study um, heterostructures, van der Waals heterostructures under pressure. Um, so he, here the idea is that if you would be able to place heterostructures under hydrostatic pressure, you could change the interlayer distance between these structures. And with this one, uh, you could uh, see how more effects, for example, evolve. So our, in our system, you can you have a circuit board, you can bond your sample on it, and you can put this full system under hydrostatic pressure up to three gigapascal. Um, so here is one of our initial measurements where we, what we have done is that we have placed the graphene on tungsten selenide crystal. And you have seen that um, we see a bit of anti-localization um, from the effect of spin orbit interaction, which you induce to, to graphene. And we, what we hope to see in these measurements that I, as you increase the pressure, you increase the, the, the anti-localization, which should signal the, the, the increase of strengths of um, induced spin orbit interaction. So why I mentioned this, that I think as, as already some papers in the literature show from, from Corrigan and Matthew Jankovic, um, it is an interesting to, to study also these, uh, these uh, Moari structures under pressure. So we are open for collaboration on this. Um, with this, I would like to thank for, for all the people working on it. This work was done in Basel, which I have shown in the group of Christian Schoenenberger we did uh, Lucien and David uh, doing most of the work and uh, the pressure study studies now are done in Budapest. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. All right, thank, thank you very much, Peter. Um, that was very interesting. Um, there's not much time for questions, uh, but if there's a quick one, um, maybe if somebody has a quick one, feel free to type it in.
Um, doesn't look like it at the moment. So um, in, in, in that case, I think we will just move on. And, you know, thanks very much again. Thanks. And uh, next up is Carmen Rubio Verdu. So Carmen, if you can share your screen. Yes, so now you should be seeing my screen. Is that right? Not yet, but it's maybe loading. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, my name is Carmen Rubio. I'm a postdoc in Avis Posupati Group at Columbia University. And thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to show our later results in twisted double bilayer graphene. So as you all know by now, uh, in 2018, in the group of Pablo Jari Guerrero, they reported two works in twisted bilayer graphene that opened a whole field of research, right? They found that when you twist two monolayers layers of graphene at the magic angle condition, flat band uh, emerges. And in those electronic flat bands, the interactions between the electrons are very important. And actually they observed the presence of correlated insulating states as well as a superconducting transition at the half filling of the conduction band. Later in the group of uh, FETOP, they found that in very clean, uniform samples, uh, that these insulating states emerge at all integer fillings and are surrounded by the superconducting states. Um, later that year, the STM results came. Uh, they reported the presence of, indeed, the opening of a gap when they tuned to half filling of this flat band. And in addition to that, what they saw is that hints of broken rotational symmetry, as you can see if you compare this local density of states map with this other one. The only thing is that at that point, these samples were not very uniform. There was a finite strain in the system. And the water regions were not very big. So that prevented understanding of this broken rotational symmetry and uh, seeing if it was truly due to electronic pneumatic uh, phase. And all of these behavior, the insulated states surrounded by superconducting domes and the pneumatic phase, this is reminiscent of what uh, people observe in high TC uh, superconductors. And the system that I would like to introduce today is just a double bilayer graphene. So in this case, each unit that we twist is an AB bilayer. Uh, basically, we take this uh, Bernal bilayer on top of the other one, and then we twist it. And uh, this year, there were a number of transfer experiments that showed that in this system, um, correlated insulating states emerge also. And in this case, you can tune them on and off with the displacement field. And also what they observe is that the insulating gap that emerges is dependent on the magnetic field. They see the opening of the, of the gap with an increased magnetic field, which points towards ferromagnetic. Uh, order or spin polarization in the system. So the questions that I would like to answer today in my talk are what happens with the flat bands in, in these systems? Where, where are they localized in real space? And can we expect some broken symmetries also in this system? And as you can imagine by now, the answer is going to be yes. So all the results that I will show today are low temperature scan time microscopy and spectroscopy. So basically we have our twisted double bilayer graphene stack here. We have the, the STM tip and we apply a bias voltage between the tip and the sample. So what that will allow us to map is the energy dependent dependence of the local density of states, as you can see here. And on top of that, what we have is a gate voltage. We have it here underneath below a silicon chip and in that way we can dope the system. So basically we can empty the states or fill them if we are in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's move to the results. Uh, this is a STM topography of around 300 uh, nanometers side of just the double value graphene from the wavelength uh, in the Morel lattice, we can extract the twist angle and we have around 1.05 degrees, which is uh, in the range of uh, the correlated states uh, emerge. And you can see that we have a very big region of pretty uniform uh, more, which makes this an ideal platform to study the phenomenology I was describing at the beginning. 
So what what happens with the uh, band structure of this uh, double balleography? Well, what it's expected is to find two flat bands that are very close to the Fermi level here, and then two remote bands that happen at higher energies. And when we measure, this is a zoom in into a few unit cells of the Moria, so you can see better. And when we measure the local density of states, what we find is precisely that, right? Two flat bands close to the Fermi level and two higher energy remote bands. However, we see these flat bands not on the AA side, which are these brightest spots in the Moray, but we see them in all three inequivalent sides. So here in white, you have the Moray unit cell, and in all the three spots, we see the, the different bands. It's just that, you know, the weight of each of the bands is different depending on the side. And this is not the case in twisted bilayer graphene. In twisted bilayer, you have all the weight on the AA side. Okay, so we have delocalized flat bands on the different sides. So what we can expect already is that there is gonna be some interesting distribution of the local density of states in real space. And that's something that we can look at in the SCM, right? So let's do it. So what I will be showing you now are local density of states maps on this region at different energies. And the energy I will highlight it with these gray lines. So you can see that at high energies, we just see the weight, the spectral weight on the A sides. Again, in white is the more unit cell, so nothing, very interesting. Now, when we set the energy to the energy of the remote flat bands, you can see that the spectral weight moves towards one of the domains and it develops this nice clover-like structures that are rotated when you go to the negative energy. And at the energy of the flat bands that are here at the Fermi level, we see that the weight again changed side. Now it's in the other domain and so shows these pretty uniform uh, shapes. But all that I've been showing here in this row is for chart neutrality. You can see that the Fermi level, this dashed line lies in between the two flat bands. So I mentioned before that we can dope the system, right? So let's see what happens when we move the Fermi level to the uh, conduction band, to the conduction flat band. I'm gonna do the same. I will show the local density of states in this region at different energies. So at high energy, we have the very same, the A sites are bright. When we set the energy to the remote flat bands, you see this triangular shapes again that change uh, to this domain. And now when we set the energy to the flat bands, it completely changed, right? You can see that for the valence band, uh, the, the density of states develop these stripe-like features that run in a particular direction of the moire. And in this case, the symmetry, the rotational symmetry has been reduced, right? So if you look at any of these other images, uh, it respects the C3 symmetry that is present in the, in the system. However, for this particular energy, for this particular gate, that's not true anymore, right? We go from C3 to C2 uh, when it develops this stripe order. So I've showed you this uh, for small regions, but I showed you at the beginning that we have these very big uh, regions of uniform more, right? Uh, so let's see what happens. Here is a 200 by 200 nanometers map. So you can see the brightest spots of the moire uh, for chart neutrality at the energy of the flat band. Now, when we do the very same thing, but at the half filling condition, so we dope the system, um, you can see that it develops these stripes that I showed you before. They are long range um, and unidirectional. So if we look at the Fourier transformation of each of these two maps, when we are at chart neutrality, you can see that three rock peaks emerge. These just come from the more lattice, right? And then in the stripy phase, we see that two of the rock peaks vanish and only one uh, survives. And this one that survives is exactly the same one as in, in this case. So basically what I'm saying is that relational symmetry is preserved in the system, but rotational symmetry is broken, right? And this is precisely uh, what one would expect from pneumatic order, from a pneumatic phase. So 
Yeah, an emetic phase is just a, a system where rotational symmetry is broken. And how can we understand this in a more hilarious? Well, this is beautiful work by Rafael Fernandez and co-workers where they model uh, nematic instability in a more hilarious. So they introduce a six band tie binding model. You have three P orbitals and three S orbitals in the Moria lattice. And what they introduce is a hoping anisotropy. So basically the nearest neighbor um, hoping is different in this direction than in these other two directions. And what that's gonna create, of course, is a distortion of the Fermi surface. So here we have the Fermi surface undistorted. And then when they introduce the nomadic instability, you can see that the Fermi surface is elongated in this direction. And that in turn is gonna affect the real space uh, more lattice, right? So if we look at the, the undistorted more, and uh, let me define three different bones. This is how they call this instability, bone order, um, that link the AA sides. So we have the blue, the red, and the green. Right, so this distortion in the Fermi surface that what it's going to make is a distortion in the Moria unit cell, basically making one of the three bones inequivalent. And that can happen in either of the three. You can have the blue different from the other two, the green or the red. And these three situations are equivalent. What this just means is that the nematic instability is going to happen in a preferential direction. Because, you know, this distortion of the Fermi surface is defined by this nematic uh, director that in principle can take any direction in the plane of the sample, but due to the, the symmetry of the Moya lattice, it's going to choose one of the three high symmetry directions. And what we see in the experiment is precisely that. So this is a map when we're at high energy, so we don't see the, the stripy phase. This is the Moya unit cell. And then at the energy of the valence slot band where we see the broken rotational symmetry phase, you can see that the stripes don't go in any random direction, but they are actually parallel to, to these uh, AA sides direction. So what all makes us think is that what uh, twisted double bodygraphy shows is a truly electronic uh, pneumatic phase. Okay, so that's all from my side. So I showed you that twisted double bodygraphene shows electronic flat bands. We observe long range broken rotational symmetry that is independent of the strain. The strain in these samples was extremely low, less than 0.1%. And the fact that we see the stripe phase along a highly crystalline direction of the system points towards truly a pneumatic order into Sadawa biography. And with that, I would like to thank uh, Abhay Pashupati, the people in his group that took part in the experiments. From the theory side, Hector Otsoa, who helped a lot to, to understand the mana structure, uh, the people in Aachen and Hamburg with the tie binding, Rafael Fernandez and co-workers uh, for the pneumatic anastability in more systems, funding agencies, and all of you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so if people have, oh, and there is one from uh, Lenny, and she's asking, sorry to be sure that I understood, you doped the conduction band, but the lack of rotational symmetry is only seen in the valence band. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. Um, yeah, you can see here, um, the Fermi level sits in the conduction, but then we see the broken symmetries in the valence band, that's true. Okay, um, next question from Chi Ming Yim. Question, is the direction of nematicity pinned when the doping level is varied in a reversible manner? Yes, so basically, if I dope out of the half filling um, condition and then I, I recover the C3 symmetry and then I go back to, the, to this filling, I see the stripes in the same direction, yes. Another question from uh, Unmesh Gorai. Um, do you see the nematic ordering at other integer fillings other than uh, a half filling? Um, not in this case. 
in this case, we, we only observe it for the health setting condition. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Doesn't, doesn't seem to be. Oh, oh there's one a follow up question from Chi Min Yim. Do you know why the direction is pinned? So I don't know, I guess uh, the reason you're asking is because, you know, this is spontaneous symmetry breaking, so there is no preferential direction for any of the three. Um, in principle, maybe one should be able to, to see any of the three, yet we, we only see one, and not only for this sample, but also for, for a different sample at a slightly higher angle. So it seems to be a characteristic of the system. A question from Abdul Hassanian. How do the DIDD maps change away from the magic angle? Oh, uh, yeah, we only have samples close to the 1.3, uh, 1.1 degrees. That that's um, the magic angle. There's, yeah, there's no truly magic angle condition, I would say, but yeah, we only have data for 1.1. 1.05 degrees. Okay. Still have time for questions if, if people have anything they want to ask. Doesn't seem to be the case. So, so thank you again, Carmen. And uh, thank you. we're a little early in time, but it's also the last talk. So I, I'd suggest that we just plow ahead and uh, and uh, you know, let Martin Martin Rodriguez Vega give his talk. Um, Martin, can can you share your screen? Yes, just a second. Okay. And can you see my screen now? Yeah, that's working. Can you go? Yeah, presentation mode. Yeah. All right, perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, all right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, so today, um, this talk, um, well, first, thank you for the opportunity to um, give this talk to the organizers. And um, <clears throat> this talk, it's going to have a slightly different flavor at the beginning. And I'm going to be discussing um, uh, flocky engineering of twisted wall validity graphene and uh, other um, also uh, twisted systems to give uh, a little bit of a survey of um, the, the flexibility that uh, Floquet drives can bring to the already um, flexible uh, twisted um, systems. So let me uh, begin this talk um, with a little bit of a uh, experimental survey on uh, driven systems. So first, um, one of the um, early experiments that uh, dem demonstrated that um, at this um, Floquet uh, physics, it's um, indeed uh, observable in experiments, uh, was done by uh, the group of uh, Nugedic uh, back in 2013. But these more recent experiments uh, show uh, a nicer um, resolution so here, what you're seeing in this plot, if you can see my cursor, can you see my cursor, by the way? Okay. Um, it's um, ARPES measurements on a bismuth selenide. As uh, you know, uh, this system has a, a Dirac cone at uh, near the Fermi level. And uh, as you send a laser pulse to the sample, you can see the formation of these um, <clears throat> side bands that basically replicate this cone. And uh, when this pulse uh, has uh, gone by, uh, the system uh, becomes again, uh, comes back to equilibrium. <clears throat> so basically this uh, central picture, it's um, one of the hallmarks of uh, flow of K physics in the, uh, in the band structure. But, um, not only the band structure can be modified, also uh, you can um, modify um, 
in properties that arise from interactions. Uh, for example, uh, in this experiment a few years ago, uh, Mitrano and collaborators uh, showed that uh, uh, you can uh, enhance uh, superconducting fluctuations and, and basically obtain uh, superconductivity above the equilibrium TC temperature. Um, on the side of the uh, topological properties, uh, very recent experiments uh, have shown that uh, you can take a graphene that we know has a cone um, in equilibrium near the Fermi level. They apply a laser with circularly polarized light, which uh, basically breaks time reversal symmetry. And they show that um, uh, you can get a gap state um, with um, non-zero uh, whole uh, conductivity. And uh, not only uh, one can um, uh, modify uh, phases in equilibrium, but drives, time dependent drives, can basically generate um, phases that are not possible to have in equilibrium, such as um, time crystals. Um, so, with uh, that, let me first give a little bit of uh, an introduction to Floquet theory. And uh, <clears throat> Let's say uh, in, in the quantum mechanics courses, uh, we mainly work uh, with uh, time independent Hamiltonians, such as this um, object here. And uh, we know that uh, the Floquet Schrodinger equation, the solution to the Floquet, uh, I mean the, the Schrodinger equation, can be written in this way formally, where we just um, take um, <clears throat> the Hamiltonian uh, times uh, the time that we propagate the system and exponentiate it. And that's our exact solution. <clears throat> now, the wave functions can be written as a product of a time independent piece times um, <clears throat> a phase factor. And that phase factor contains uh, this conserved quantity uh, due to the time translational symmetry. Uh, that is just uh, the energy. Now, <clears throat> plugging this in the Schrodinger equation leads to the usual eigenvalue equation that we um, uh, one works uh, typically with. Now, when you have time dependence in, in general, uh, the, the, the main um, consequence is that there is no more time translational symmetry. So you don't have uh, conserved quantities, uh, like the, the conserved quantity that is the energy anymore. However, if uh, you can keep at least a, um, <clears throat> a discrete time translational symmetry, uh, we can make a bit of more, more progress. And in this case, um, and the solution of the Schrodinger equation in a bit more general sense can be written in this way, uh, where you have uh, a time order exponential of, of the Hamiltonian. And, and this object is quite a bit more complicated um, than this one uh, on the left of your screen. So in this case, um, the, the, the wave functions can be written as a product of a piece that is periodic in time as uh, we can see down here uh, that shares the same periodicity of the Hamiltonian and a phase factor that contains uh, the so-called uh, quasi-energies. And uh, finally, this uh, wave function uh, form leads to the so-called uh, Floquet-Schrodinger equation and that now has the advantage that uh, deals with uh, time periodic um, wave functions here. Now, <clears throat> One can, uh, well, this equation is still a bit challenging to work with, but it has the advantage that, that uh, uh, we can exploit the periodicity of the wave functions, um, these so called steady states, and we can expand those in a Fourier basis. And with that, uh, we can cast uh, this uh, Floquet Schrodinger equation in this way here. Uh, where you, here we have uh, the Fourier modes of the Hamiltonian defined down here, um, the drive, the frequency of the drive, and the quasi energies. And this, notice that this is now um, time independent, but we have paved the price that we are dealing now with an infinite dimensional representation. That, but we can uh, deal with that in different limits uh, when we're working. So we can uh, uh, distinguish. Uh, roughly uh, three different um, regimes uh, for the driven systems. 
and so depending in, in, in which regime we are, uh, basically tells us the difficulty that we're going to face when trying to solve these problems. <clears throat> so in this um, uh, scale up here, um, I'm uh, selecting three, uh, a couple of um, energies of uh, a material that you can think of. Uh, the first one is uh, the bandwidth. Um, I'll use an H here, sorry. And uh, the, second, the second one is um, a gap. Just imagine that you're dealing with an insulator. So if the drive frequency or the frequency of the laser, it's larger than the um, bandwidth, and we can say that we're in the high frequency regime. If um, our frequency, it's somewhere in between um, in resonance with uh, one of the bands of the system, we call this uh, the resonant regime. And um, if the frequency is lower uh, uh, than the gap of the system, we can say that we're in, in a, a low frequency regime. Now in the high frequency regime, I'm showing here an example in, in, this, in this plot on the left of your screen. And you can see two main effects uh, when you compare the gray curve, which is the static case with a purple curve, uh, which is uh, the, the, the quasi generators for the driven systems. So you see that uh, you modify the bandwidth of the system and you open up a gap. However, <clears throat> when you consider a low frequency system, uh, the picture is more, more, much more complicated. Since you are folding in uh, the spectrum of the system, and you can have uh, a number of resonances at, at the edges of uh, uh, the, the floquet zone. So uh, one needs to be a bit more careful in that regime. However, this low frequency regime, uh, it, it's uh, for, from an experimental point of view, it's better because it reduces uh, unwanted heating effects uh, that arise in interacting systems. Uh, so with this, I'm going to jump now into the topic of this conference. Um, that is uh, twisted um, uh, Moria systems. And uh, we're going to consider first uh, low frequency driven but, uh, twisted ballet graphene. And here I'm showing just a picture of uh, the, the situation that I'm, uh, I'm imagining. So basically, you send a laser, uh, normal incident normally to the, to the sample. And uh, the, the, uh, to model uh, this laser, you basically uh, do, uh, we basically do minimal coupling where the momentum goes to the momentum minus the time dependent vector potential. And this Hamiltonian has uh, the usual uh, structure where uh, in the block diagonals you have the Hamiltonian for each uh, of the graphing layers and you have the tunneling matrix in the off diagonals. Now the effective Floquet Hamiltonian, we can turn the crank and write it in this way. Uh, where HL is the average Hamiltonian and H omega, it's the correction due to the drive. Now in the high frequency regime, uh, there were previous works uh, that uh, found that uh, <clears throat> the spectrum uh, gets a gap because you are breaking um, time reversal symmetry that goes as a one over and the frequency. However, <clears throat> when you go uh, to the low frequency regime, uh, which was uh, the, the interest of our work, you can generate a very large uh, number of different terms that you can select uh, by appropriately choosing uh, the frequency omega and the strength of uh, your drive. I don't want to dwell too much into like, each of these terms, but I just want to highlight <clears throat> that each of these terms can give a different um, a distortion of, of the band structures of the mass structure when you are near uh, the magic angle. So the next thing uh, that we think about um, in order to, to try to uh, modify the system uh, was uh, to use uh, what uh, it's called longitudinal uh, light. And basically <clears throat> when light propagates in free space, um, your electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to your propagation direction. However, if you confine the light into a waveguide, uh, you can develop vector potentials in the direction um, of your propagation. And that basically allows you um, to couple the light to the interlayer tunneling. Now you can see here the new time-dependent Hamiltonian, 
where the time dependence now comes on the tunneling part. And in this case, <clears throat> you can uh, either decrease or decrease the tunneling amplitude depending on the frequency of the laser. So basically, if you are in the so-called high frequency regime, uh, you acquire uh, these prefactors of the vessel function and you can decrease um, the tunneling amplitude. But if you go to the low frequency regime, this can be increased. And you can see that here uh, with the green dots that basically have a uh, lower uh, Fermi velocity. And now we jump into the twisted double Balayer case. Here and the Hamiltonian, it's a bit uh, more, more cumbersome, but uh, the time dependence comes in the same way as uh, the, the previous example for uh, twisted Balayer graphene with light propagating in frame space. So where basically your momentum is modified. And uh, in this case, uh, something interesting um, happens. So here I'm showing you uh, the band structure um, near uh, the K and K prior points. And uh, in gray, uh, in both cases, you have um, the static energies. And in dashed, you have the effective quasi energies. And the first thing that you notice is that depending if, if you are on K, on K prime, uh, you modify uh, the bands near uh, the, the K plus or K minus points in the mini brillant zone. <clears throat> and uh, you can play with uh, the intensity of the laser and find that there is indeed a, a gap closing at a critical value of the laser intensity that introduces a um, change in the topology of the system. Uh, that is revealed by calculating uh, the winding number down here. Now, if you consider an ABBA configuration um, for, for the stacking, um, the bands evolve in a different way um, compared to the uh, uh, ABAB case. But uh, in, and nevertheless, you also can find um, uh, gap and closings that change the topology of the system. So with that, I'm going to list uh, our uh, contributions that uh, in, in short came to show that uh, Floquet uh, drives, in this case, lesser drives, can bring uh, more flexibility to, 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 this, um, uh, to these systems. And uh, I'm going to uh, leave you with uh, the acknowledgements of my supervisor, uh, Professor Greg Pitt, and uh, my collaborator, uh, Michael Pogel. And thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was very interesting. Um, before we go to questions, I, I just want to um, point out that um, we will take a group photo again after this uh, session. So uh, don't go to lunch just yet. <laughs> and uh, if anybody has, has a question for uh, Martin, um, feel free to, to type it into the, into the chat. Is there anything? I suspect people might already be very hungry because it's, uh, it's <laughs> past lunchtime here. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so it doesn't seem to be any questions. So I'll 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 hand over to uh, Maria Jose for for taking the the group picture. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, please now uh, activate your cameras. Good. In fact, you can also unmute yourselves and we can probably give a big round of applause for all the speakers today. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take a picture. Okay. One, two, three, smile. <laughs> Good, thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks everybody for attending. So we'll have, of course, the, okay. third, the third session tomorrow, same time, same place. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, sure. hope you all ha ha have a good rest of your days. Okay. Thank See you. you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.